via satellite to be launched by GSLV from Srihari Kota. Keeping with India's emergence as an economic and technological powerhouse, ISRO is now working towards manned flight. Many technologies were demonstrated as a precursor to the first manned mission. The experimental mission that paved the way for human spaceflight mission was the space capsule recovery experiment conducted in January 2007. After the successful launch of Chandrayaan-2 on board the Mark III M2, ISRO now boasts an operational heavy lift launcher capable of putting a 10-ton spacecraft in lower Earth orbit. The maturity gained over the years in the launch vehicle area will be gleaned to engineer a human-rated GSLV MK3 vehicle worthy of human spaceflight. ISRO is also taking the industry on board for increasing the capability to become a global hub for the space industry. With more than 108 satellites and 77 launch vehicle missions, ISRO has proved to the world that India is second to none in the application of space technology to the real problems of man and society. ISRO Achievements The saga of the Indian satellite began with Aryabhatta, the first Indian satellite from a simple spin-stabilized satellite in the low Earth orbit to the highly complex interplanetary missions. The evolution of the Indian satellites in the last five decades has been phenomenal and astonishing. Today, India is one of the pioneering countries to use satellites for its rapid overall development. It has been a challenging and interesting journey over the years with an array of satellites for communication, meteorological, remote sensing, navigation, scientific satellites and when it comes to rockets like SLV, ASLV, PSLV, GSLV and GSLV Mark III. These satellites and rockets have been built by different ISRO centers. Plus one. India has joined an elite space club by launching Mars Orbiter mission in 2013 and made India the first nation to succeed in its maiden attempt to reach Mars. Another feather in ISRO's cap was added when the constellation of seven satellites created India's very own satellite navigation system. On February 15, 2017, ISRO created history and a world record by successfully launching 104 satellites on a single mission PSLV C-37. On November 14, 2018, ISRO successfully launched GSAT-29 from Srihari Kota, the satellite weighing at 3,423 kilograms. It was the heaviest satellite to be launched. Oh, good afternoon, all. Uh, myself, Kiran Kumar, uh, chairing for PS1 Day 3 Session A, and Kandula V. Subramanyam uh, is a co-chair for this session and uh, he will be assisting me from the remote from hyderabad uh, during in this uh, we have eight speakers and one invited lecture and uh, one lead talk uh, now i would like to uh, introduce speaker invited speaker i take this opportunity to introduce today's session invited speaker dr Gyanapalam, Associate Professor, Indian Institute of Space Science Technology, Thiruvananthapuram. Ma'am did B.Tech in Engineering from College of Agricultural Engineering, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. M.Tech in Remote Sensing from College of Engineering, Anna University, Chennai. Ph.D. in Remote Sensing and Geographic Information System in Coastal Biodiversity from M.S. Swaminathan Research Foundation, University of Madras, Chennai. 
under the supervision of Professor M. S. Swaminathan. Her area of research includes digital image processing, hyperspectral, lidar remote sensing, GIS, spatial modeling for mangroves and coastal ecosystem. She has more than 20 years of experience in remote sensing and GIS applications. Served as scientist and senior scientist in MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Chennai for 14 years. Ma'am is associate consultant GIS in Pentasoft Technologies, Chennai. Accomplished seven projects as PI and co-PI funded by Government of Maharashtra, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Department of Space, Canada International Development Agency and MOES. Supervised three students for PhD and presently guiding two students. Madam published more than 20 papers in peer reviewed international journals and co authored three books. Madam also advisory committee for Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change since 2018. With this, may I now invite Professor Yanapalam, in Indian Institute of Space Science Technology, Thirunanthapuram, to present her invited talk on assessment of mangroves from space. Over to Madam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kiran Kumar, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon to all. Um, um, may I share my screen? Hello. May I share my screen? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I hope you are able to see. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And just please let me know if this is moving to the next slide. Just let me know. The slides yes. are moving. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Let me Thank go you. Ahead. And uh, yeah. uh, I will remind you just before five minutes of your uh, uh, talk, ma'am. Yes, sure. Before you. Yeah, yeah. I think this is for 30 minutes or 40 minutes. It's for 40 yeah. minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, invitation to deliver the lecture on the mangroves assessment from space. And I've been working in mangroves since my PG, after completion of my PG. And of course, I finished my research only 10 years back. Still, I was doing working on mangroves only. Initially, I was working in the mangroves of Pichavaram, Tamil Nadu. And then I started moving towards the other regions uh, of the Indian coast. So this lecture will give you a brief on the uh, what are mangroves, what are the uh, specifications of mangroves, ecological and then economic specifications of mangroves, and then how we go about uh, making use of space science or uh, remote sensing in assessing the mangroves and its uh, different characteristics through uh, remote sensing. So this picture is uh, the mangroves of the Pichavaram, uh, which is always inundated by the tides. And the corresponding satellite image, this is very high resolution image of Iconos uh, image of the mangrove region. And you can see the uh, undisturbed mangroves. These are all the mangroves. Of course, I hope all of you would be able to uh, interpret the false color composite. Uh, maybe if there are any questions, please intervene in between. So this is a normal false color composite of the uh, satellite data, where these are the mangroves which are um, undisturbed, whereas you can see the different patterns which are disturbed by either uh, for the management purpose or for the encroachment related activities. And these are the adjoining features uh, which are associated with the mangroves, like uh, aqua forms, uh, then the uh, coastal uh, structures like jetty, the uh, nearby and then tourism and all, right? So just to introduce you about the image and the what are mangroves. So uh, the mangroves, not only in India, globally, they have very diversified ecosystems. Uh, on the left hand side, what you see is the mangroves. You can see there is a railway track in between the mangroves. Uh, I'll come to the what are the mangroves and specifications later. Of course, you can consider them as a forest, a forest evergreen forest. So you can find the uh, uh, railway track within the mangroves and then so many uh, urban structures nearby mangroves. This is nothing but the mangroves of uh, Mumbai, 
which are surrounded by the urban agg agglomeration. The corresponding satellite image, this is the uh, Tane Creek. Uh, you must be aware of that creek near to Mumbai. So uh, the Tane Creek is surrounded by the mangroves. The, all the red portions are all mangroves. Immediately after that, you, whatever you are seeing with white patches, with regular patterns of roads and streets, are the city of Mumbai. Right? And you can see the uh, bridge which is cutting across the creek also. So it is uh, uh, the mangroves is uh, completely surrounded by the urban uh, land cover. Whereas if you come to the uh, eastern part of the mang eastern uh, mangroves of India, which is nothing but the Sundarbans, uh, the uh, largest mangroves of the uh, uh, world. Uh, so you can see this is the extent of mangroves. Whereas these are the interior vegetation, whether it is agricultural area or other forest cover. This is completely away from the uh, uh, urban settlement or the human inter interactions. So this is very much protected. Okay, so you can find the difference. This is completely surrounded by urban area, whereas here it is, uh, it is not much uh, influenced by the uh, human intervention. The same thing you can see here also the uh, photograph of the Sundarbans region where you can see the boat also, which is. Uh, for the transportation as well as for the fisherman community. You can see very big open space beyond the mangroves. Uh, you can see the, only the open sky right? beyond the extent of mangroves. Not only this, these are in the two extremes of the east and west coast of India. So you can, we can see very different ecosystems, a mangrove ecosystem all along the uh, coast of the uh, Indian. Indian. Not only India, uh, across the globe, and if you see uh, the special features on mangroves, as I was telling, they are along the coast. They are tropical evergreen forests. They lie within the tropical region, maybe plus on 40 degree north to the 40 degree south, uh, approximately. So they lie only in the tropical region. They are considered as evergreen forest. And mainly they are pushed from the terrestrial uh, vegetation towards the coast just because they are saline tolerant and they have salt ex excluding mechanism. So the fresh water, they, though they love fresh water, they are pushed because they are uh, saline tolerant. So the mangroves are always seen in the coastal region where they can uh, survive with the uh, salt water as well as they are highly inundated. Daily they are inundated by the tides. So you can see this is the mangroves and uh, you can always uh, see it is inundated with water. Here also you can see the water. This is after the inundation has receded back. You can see the uh, roots. So these are the special adaptations of the mangroves for their survival along the coast. So they have still roots, still roots. These are roots generating from the main stem to uh, fix on the earth so, so as to avoid the uh, erosion from the water. So this is a special adaptation of the uh, mangroves, similarly pneumatophores. So these are the uh, roots which are coming out from the root uh, and then they come up to the above the ground. So these are all the special mechanism for the respiration purpose because they are highly uh, regularly inundated. And this is the viviparous seeds which are, they grow on the tree itself. They just started grow, the seeds started growing on the tree itself and directly fall on uh, on the soil and then started growing, right? So these are the special adaptations so that they can survive on the coastal region. But still, these special adaptations give additional benefits. Uh, that is why the mangroves are considered as more important uh, forest system. Though the terrestri uh, all forests are important, they play, the mangroves are considered to be a more important uh, uh, coastal ecosystem in many aspects. So they have ecological uh, as well as economic benefits. As far as the ecology is concerned, they are as coastal erosion. So you can see this is a, a mangrove forest from the uh, aerial view. Uh, so they have the, uh, you can see the uh, sedimentation or the uh, accretion of the along the coast. So they stop because uh, if there are vegetation, they uh, obviously arrest the erosion of the uh, soil because of the root structure which is uh, firmly fixing on the soil. So if it is uh, lying along the coast, obviously it re reduces the erosion and it fixes the sediments which are coming 
from the river which is from the uh, upstream side from the upstream the river water is coming here so it tries to fix the sediments and then uh, land development process it takes place because of the mangroves and apart from that they are breeding place for numerous marine organisms all the uh, fish prawns and then variety of marine organisms they uh, live in the mangrove ecosystem and this uh, substratum that is the this sort of still truths and the nematophores are the breeding place or the living place for the variety of marine organisms so these things are harvested by the local community though it is uh, ecological benefit it is interrelated both ecological and economic benefits are interrelated and also it acts as a bio shield against the coastal hazard most of you would have heard that uh, we encountered the tsunami in 2005 so wherever the mangroves were there uh, the adjoining coastal community were very much protected uh, by reducing the force of the uh, tsunami waves when it is going through the mangroves it has subsided the energy of the tsunami waves so uh, not only uh, tsunami uh, but also the uh, cyclonic and storm surges can be reduced because of the presence of uh, thick forest along the coast so this is again uh, not only ecology but also economic benefits it reduces the losses both in human lives as well as the uh, infrastructure loss and the major thing is it contributes more in the blue carbon sequestration blue carbon most of you must be knowing that it is the carbon amount of carbon sequestered by the coastal region or the water uh, bodies so this contributes more uh, in blue carbon sequestration and also it is three or four times uh, carbon sequestered by the mangroves than the terrestrial forest uh, the other thing is it traps heavy metals which are polluting to the coastal region uh, when the uh, heavy metals are coming from the different uh, human activities along the rivers they stop or trap the sediments before it flows through the coastal environment and thus affecting the uh, marine organisms as well as the other uh, ecologically uh, sensitive organisms like coral reefs and all so these are all uh, few ecological benefits and also it has more economic benefits to the local uh, communities by providing livelihood for their for them they mostly fish within the mangroves and they get many other by products like wood honey and then fuel the loss or dead mangroves they use it as a fuel and uh, there are many researches which are carried out uh, for their medicinal value and of course it is uh, very well known for the tourism and research and education so so uh, the conservation of mangroves become important and it is very well related to the sustainable development goals 13 14 15 so uh, the main thing is to assess the extent of the mangroves the, thereby you can link it directly the uh, the extent of the mangroves is important so that the carbon sequestration is there so that the all ecological benefits are achieved and then economic benefits are there so uh, you have to sustainably manage the forest so as to avoid the desertification diversity loss and also degradation of the coastal region so it is directly linked with the uh, many of the sustainable development goals talking about this ecological as well as the economic benefits uh, coming to the extent of the mangroves where we can see the uh, space uh, technology or how we can uh, assess the mangrove extent this is again this extent is assessed through satellite remote sensing only making use of multiple uh, satellite data from various countries this is given by ponting et al in 2018 of course by uh, the the process is very long because it is global estimation it takes more than 5 uh, 6 years so the data used was about 2010 data so there is about uh, about 137000 square kil kilometer of mangroves lying within this region this is the tropical region where you can find the extent of the mangroves is very high in this southeast asian countries compared to the western countries and here also you can see this is the uh, south asian countries harbor much higher mangrove extent as well as the diversified mangroves also we can find in this region including india 
So this is the species composition. That is what I was telling about the diversity, the biological diversity. Mainly the mangrove species diversity is very much high in this region where the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean confluence happens. So this region is found to be very high with a maximum of 40, 30 to 60 species, whereas the other continents harbors very less uh, species. They have very less species. Coming to India, uh, so this is this map is prepared from the data of survey uh, for a survey of India. So we have uh, mangroves from Gulf of Kutch from the west coast to the uh, Sundarbans and also the group of islands, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So uh, we can see here uh, the size of the circle shows the extent of the mangroves, the aerial extent of the mangroves. Uh, of course, Sundarbans harbors very large mang uh, mangrove cover, about 2,000 square kilometers, uh, globally uh, big mangrove forest, which is very much equivalent to or nearby we are getting in the Gujarat also uh, in Gulf of Kutch, Gulf of Kampath. Actually, these things are, uh, the circles are specified in the particular mangrove region, not just for the state. So, Kutch, Kambat, uh, Mangrove, Tane Creek, different parts of Maharashtra, Goa. So, we, we can see the mangrove extent is very much large in the northern region or uh, in towards north compared to the south. Uh, there are many reasons, uh, the ecological uh, ecosystem of the mangroves. And also, we have very good freshwater source from the northern region because of the perennial rivers compared to the southern region. And also the spread of the delta or the creeks that also uh, contributes more here. Uh, there is a huge delta or spread. Tidal class occurs in the Gujarat region uh, and similarly in the West Bengal, the Gangetic Delta uh, that uh, that supports the uh, development of the mangroves or the spread of the mangroves in the northern area uh, than the southern region. There is one more. Uh, parameter or prop, uh, characteristic which influence or which favors the growth of mangroves is the tidal amplitude. So as the tidal amplitude increases towards the north of the uh, uh, peninsula region, uh, it is about uh, 8 to 10 meters in the West Bengal, whereas the tidal amplitude is very low in the southern region, uh, up to 1 meter only. So as the this tidal amplitude, the freshwater resource and the uh, this makes on the uh, substrate the favorable substratum uh, causes the development of the mangroves or increased area of mangroves in the northern regions compared to the southern region. And this number shows the uh, species composition. This has the difference, right? When you see the west coast, the number of species is less uh, other than Maharashtra. There are about 22 and other than that, it is less than uh, 20. Whereas coming to the uh, east coast, you, the West Bengal has, uh, has about 33 mangrove species and Orissa has even still higher, 35 mangrove species. Andaman Nicobar has 38 mangrove species. So the East Coast has the diverse uh, mangroves, uh, mangrove ecosystem with more number of species. And of course, Andaman Nicobar Islands, the area is also large as well as they have more, uh, the maximum number of species available. Uh, the Lakshadweep, of course, they also have mangrove species, but they are uh, less than a hectare or square kilometer, which is not mapped by uh, satellite data. There are mangroves, but they are not uh, in the scale so that it can be mapped through satellite remote sensing. So is it OK? Can I proceed? I hope it is clear and uh, the slides are clear. Yeah, yes, ma'am, you can proceed. OK, thank you. So this uh, table shows the mangroves of uh, India mapped by Forest Survey of India from 87 onwards. From 87 onwards, Forest Survey of India, uh, uh, this started mapping using remote sensing data, multispectral remote sensing data from 1987 onwards. At the interval of initially, it was in at the interval of two years and then later it was in three years and then again it became two years now. So uh, they map the changes of the uh, entire Indian forests where mangroves are also a component of the uh, coastal forest. So this is, uh, you can see this top portion, uh, the top rows are belonging to the west coast mangroves and this is for the east coast and then this and the Manicobar Islands. 
uh, we can see in the uh, from 87 up to this 95 or 93 there are no mangroves reported in these states dominant Diu or karnataka or kerala the mangroves were not reported and after 93 or 94 the uh, the mangroves have been mapped or reported from this region uh, on the west coast whereas here other than Puducherry, all these states harbors mangroves from 87 onwards must be available from 70s or earlier time itself, right? So here we can see the mangroves of Gujarat. Initially, it was about 427. Now you can see about 1177 square kilometers. There is a huge increase in the mangrove area from 87 to 2019. Similarly, Maharashtra also from 140 to 320 square kilometers it has increased, and Goa also. So this is the major change we could see along the west coast of uh, India, uh, whereas there are a, a bit of oscillation in the east coast of India, but still there are increase in mangroves. So these things were like West Bengal, Orissa and some of the Andhra mangroves uh, and Tamil Nadu mangroves are protected as reserve forest or biosphere reserve or um, uh, wildlife sanctuary. So these are all uh, different uh, terms which are uh, are different um, uh, regulations which are developed uh, means uh, uh, recognized by the uh, government of india or the ministries so most of these mangroves are protected and they don't show much of variations uh, other than the natural uh, degradation or natural regeneration in the protected area so east coast has uh, not much uh, changes compared to the west coast Similarly, we can find it in Andaman Nicobar Island also. There is an oscillation, but still it is there is an increase in mangroves, whereas again it has come back to 600 square kilometer. If you find the overall change, there is an uh, increase in mangroves from 4046 to 4975 square kilometer between 87 to 2019. There is about uh, 40 years at 40 years interval. So, uh, uh, I'm showing these various geomorphological settings of Indian mangroves, though I have taken this from the Google Earth. So, you can see the various, uh, starting from Gujarat to West Bengal, whatever the green dots I have given are uh, the mangrove regions. So, you can find the different settings of the uh, geomorphology of the uh, mangrove ecosystem. Uh, these are all tidal flat region, you can see the uh, the bigger patch wherein only the mangroves are seen, uh, other things are not there. And it start growing within the tidal flood. They are uh, developed tidal flats. Earlier, they could not have been tidal flat at all. And then because of the generation of the mangroves, the tidal flats have been developed and then the mangroves tend to increase. This is a land accretion. This is due to the land accretion. It has happened. And we can find the Gulf mangroves, Gulf of Kambat, and then this is creek mangroves near the man Mumbai. So this is the city of Mumbai. So there are creek mangroves. Uh, this is Tane Creek. Of course, this is a uh, hilly area. So these are the mangrove region, creeks mangroves. And then estuarine mangroves, they fall within the estuarine region. Again, creeks. This is Pichavara mangroves. This is this also under estuarine complex. Here you can see the lagoon system. So the water, uh, sea water goes in and then come out. So this is a kind of lagoon system. Here, uh, the Sundarbans delta X system, you can see the, uh, the dense network of rivers from the, of the Ganga Delta. Right? Uh, again, this is the uh, delta X system of uh, Mahanadi in Orissa. And this is in Andhra Pradesh here again in Krishna Delta of Andhra Pradesh. So we have different uh, geomorphological settings of mangroves all along the Indian coast, including the islands. This is uh, uh, islands of Andaman Nicobar. Though it is in the islands, they follow the creek system. Uh, they form within the creeks of the uh, islands. So generally the assessment or the mapping of the earth resources is carried out initially with the traditional survey, the civil survey, and then after the development of uh, aerial uh, aircrafts and then aerial survey, uh, mapping or assessment has been made through aerial photographs, uh, photogrammetric methods, and then after the invent of uh, satellite, uh, the remote sensing methods have been used, and then of course uh, GPS or GIS or any navigation system and then recently this UAV and drone, they have major influence on the 
mapping the resources at very high resolution or even the uh, small land holdings uh, less than a hectare can be mapped and then monitored through drone surveys. So this, uh, how this geospatial technology has evolved the, through, uh, there are um, initially the survey instruments were there, the survey instruments and then uh, the airplane and then electronic devices, computers and then space technology, the internet, the hardware computing, uh, the hardware development, ICT development, ICT and then mobile. Nowadays all things are available in mobile. Even you can visualize or even you can do small, small analysis, image processing analysis done in the mobile with the development of all the uh, technology. So the different fields have emerged about based on the developments like cartographic. Initially it was cartographic, then aerial photographs. We started working with the photogrammetric uh, equipments and then photogrammic software again. And then how you visualize the satellite data, the multiple satellite data can be visualized. And then the uh, development of the space technology uh, helped us to get the very high resolution in terms of the space as well as the spectral resolution, temporal resolution. And then microwave sensors were uh, used to uh, map the earth resources in different perspective in uh, even when the cloud is there we will be able to map the earth resources then the interoperability the software uh, uh, the data uh, exchange between the different data formats so these things uh, up currently we are with very high resolution uh, indian satellite also we Cartosat has submitter or uh, less than 50 meters, uh, 50 centimeters resolution satellite data we have and then the open data policy uh, the, with the applications we have now come to the level that anyone is able to access the very high resolution data as well and then uh, and the technologies are available in the web in a, uh, a fraction of second you will be able to access the data and you will be able to analyze the data on the web you don't have any you don't need any software or hardware to access the data uh, the, the web uh, internet if you have an internet and a system it is more than sufficient to do the analysis that is the status of remote sensing uh, for earth observation so there is a tremendous growth from uh, 60s or 70s onwards within the last 40 50 years So coming to the remote sensing, little basics based on the source of energy, uh, most of you must be knowing there are passive and then active sensors. The passive sensors are similar to the camera uh, or taking the photograph with the solar light or the when sunlight is available. Uh, whereas the active sensor or active uh, remote sensing makes use of the uh, specific electromagnetic radiation depending upon the requirement. Uh, they can acquire data at any time, Some, like radar or lidar data, we can acquire. It is similar to uh, taking photograph with uh, flashlight. So this is active remote sensing. You make use of the your own energy and uh, uh, make use of solar energy is passive remote sensing. So this is based on the energy source used. And based on platforms, we have different remote sensing like ground-based remote sensing, um, very much used in the uh, agricultural or forest inventory, ground-based sensors are used. And then the aerial and then drone images are used and then space-borne remote sensing. So there are uh, different levels or based on the platforms or the elevation of the sensors which we use for earth, remote, uh, earth observation. So based on type of electromagnetic range we use, uh, optical remote sensing, thermal remote sensing and microwave remote sensing. So optical makes use of the range of EMR between 0.25 to 2.5 micrometers. Thermal makes use from 3 to 14 micrometer and microwave makes use of greater than 1 uh, millimeter of electromagnetic radiation for earth observation. And uh, uh, this, uh, the region of electromagnetic radiation which are transparent to the atmo uh, atmosphere. Right. The atmosphere is transparent to these regions are used for earth observation. So these regions are used, uh, mostly you can find these regions falling under this region which are transparent. The atmosphere is transparent to this electromagnetic radiation which are called atmospheric windows. So these within these regions we have the sensors for earth observation so that without the disturbance of the atmosphere we will be able to map the earth, earth features.
So uh, these are different components of remote sensing for earth observation. Uh, suppose if it is an active remote sensing, we get the solar radiation. There is an interaction with the atmosphere, whereas the interaction happening within the earth features are very much important for the earth observation. Whether it is vegetation or soil or any any feature on the uh, earth. So we are very much interested in the reflectance or absorptance. Reflectance of the feature or absorptance of the features on the earth surface. So we want to remove the interaction of the atmosphere that is we generally call it as radiometric correction. So whatever happening here is very much important and that is retrieved at the satellite data is analyzed and then we give the different outputs whether it is land use land cover mapping or geological or water resources or vegetation or urban. So uh, uh, we make use of this uh, spectra or the spectral signature of each of the features. These are the major features, soil, water, vegetation, snow, uh, and then this is a, again kind of soil. So these are the major features which we can derive from the satellite data and then the uh, finer details depending upon the resolution, various resolution of the sensor, we can make use of for further uh, uh, interpretation about the each of this feature. So why I am saying is related to the vegetation, which is again will be used for the mangroves. Madam, two minutes. Yeah. Good, ma two minutes. Yes. Oh. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll move on to this mangroves again. Uh, so this is. So when the mangroves uh, may take because I have not come to the mangroves uh, uh, may take 10 minutes extra. Is it okay or? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Actually, uh, other other people will be going to other sessions. That's why. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. okay, I'll try to finish. Fine, fine. So the mangrove mapping and monitoring the diversity, there are the biochemical or biophysical or environmental parameters can also be mapped with various techniques of remote sensing GIS field survey. There are multispectral, hyperspectral, lidar and then spectrometry, microwave remote sensing are used. And uh, the recently the multi, multi remote sensing, various type of remote sensing data are used for the better management. So the mangroves, uh, we can map, uh, these are all the properties which I have mentioned. This is one such example where uh, these two are mapped from the uh, topo sheets, the mangrove extent, this is the mangrove extent. From 77 onwards, there is a continuous degradation. In 94, we can find the degradation. And I have witnessed this when I was working in MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. So far, there was no intervention. The extent was mapped. Only after the uh, after mapping through satellite data, uh, the mangrove management uh, people, those who do mangrove management, they intervene. This much of mangroves were existing earlier, so we will be able to restore them in this region, provided if we give the favorable conditions. So after that, mangrove conservation and then the restoration activities were carried out, which resulted uh, in. 96-99 onwards, the, the restoration practices resulted in this much restoration. In, this is 2011 image, of course, now also. This is almost completely restored because the remote sensing output gives the uh, better information to map and then also for the management activities. So uh, this is another example of monitoring the mangroves. You can find from 75 to 2000, the mangroves have reduced. And here in another region, you can see the increase in the mangroves. Similarly, this the same area. Here you can find the changes in the geomorphological settings of the Mahanadi mangroves. And this, is, uh, this shows the finding the change reduction, whether it is densified or de regenerated or there is a mangrove degradation. So very high resolution uh, mapping we can do with a very high uh, means like Cartosat uh, recent data. So these are different image processing techniques, whether it is uh, pixel based or object based. We have different indices uh, like vegetation indices, textural properties and geometric properties and different classification algorithms. Uh, maybe I, I will take only one slide, which. Uh, 
to estimate the biomass and then maybe I'll close it. So these are different uh, uh, hyperspectral high resolution means every CNG is one of the uh, high resolution hyperspectral data which is flown over different places of India recently and then it helped in uh, mapping very high resolution uh, species level mapping and uh, this is a large scale mapping. Uh, this is again based on the indices all across the India. This mapping has been uh, carried out. So whatever I'm showing is based on my uh, research. And this shows the time series analysis of uh, multi-temporal data. And this shows the uh, health, health status of the mangroves from based on the time series composite from 2013 to 18. What is the current trend? These are persistently degrading the red color shows and then the purple colors are persistently increasing. Uh, the health is increasing. So we can have the time series data analysis as well. And we can work on the biomass or biophysical parameters making use of satellite data. Uh, yeah, only this thing I will explain and then close it. So uh, this is one of the study which we carried out in the mangroves of Mumbai. We make use of LIDAR system. This is terrestrial laser scanner. And then we occur the uh, in scanning of the region at tree level as well as the plot level. This is the tree level point clouds of LIDAR point clouds which have been used to uh, structure, three dimensional structure of the tree can be extracted. So this will help us to extract the volume of the tree and then we can convert to biomass and then the biocarbon. Similarly for the plot level, uh, this is a plot level uh, scanning which is used to extract the volume of the plot and then uh, easily we will be able to extend it to carbon estimates. And this shows the pneumatophores which I was showing. This also contribute more in the biomass estimation as well as the biocarbon uh, assessment. So uh, there are various uh, components of uh, remote sensing which help us. Uh, this is again multi-scale uh, remote sensing, making use of Landsat, Everest, Worldview, uh, uh, very high resolution images. And uh, uh, the integration of GIS will help us to uh, do a better decision support system for the mangrove management. And this is open source platform which is given by uh, NRSC for so this also helps us to take many uh, satellite data as well as the derived products. And one more advantage is Google Earth Engine Code Editor that helps us to take uh, any sort of satellite data from the archive. Uh, maybe I'll show you here. This is the, uh, we can explore any data between this year. This is year specified. So we can uh, extract any data of uh, a globe, global level between any time uh, with all proper uh, parameters set and then we can do the any image processing on the net independent of the software. You don't have to download it, uh, pre-process it, all those things. So in one go, you'll be able to do any sort of analysis and this is very really uh, useful and then beneficial for the mangrove management uh, authorities. So um, thank you. I'm sorry if I have taken a lot of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, man. No problem. Uh, it's fine. Actually, a very interesting talk, and we feel uh, sad to, but sorry to interrupt you in between. Uh, no and it's, uh, we thank you, ma'am, and uh, for interesting and informative talk. And I'm thank just seeing the chat box if because any questions will uh, chat box people will be asking. I mean, attendees okay. will be asking. Uh, okay. I did not see any questions. So, ma'am, I would like to ask you a couple of questions, quick questions. Sure. Uh, like a very interesting talk first of all thank uh, you, uh, you. ma'am is there make we are working in the uh, boundary layer and cloud rain rain related things okay. uh, whether any raindrop side distribution or will uh, have any role in this uh, mangroves ma'am uh, any 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 papers uh, or anything uh, raindrop distribution i i didn't raindrop get side distribution or uh, uh, like uh, a, a, you have come across anything like that? Uh, if uh, through satellite remote sensing, you are saying, or uh, if there uh, are. <laughs> what I'm asking is, uh, see, rain forms and uh, we'll have a sedimentation and uh, uh, rain flow, water flow will be there, no? Fine. So, uh, whether that has any effect on this mangrove, is one of your slides I saw 
uh, uh, like effect of rain water or anything in your yeah of course of course the, because this carry all the water because the mangroves lie along the coast and mostly in the deltaic region right deltaic region are creeks the rain water which is flowing from the upland region will be coming through the mangroves only so uh if whatever the sediments carried out by the uh, rain water will be deposited within the mangroves so actually this improves the ecosystem of the mangroves whatever water carried by the river system improves the mangrove system and also it uh, avoids the toxic uh, elements which is going into the marine system so this is uh, both beneficial to the mangroves as well as to the adjoining ecosystem yes and one question from nrl Uh, yes. How do you differentiate between forest trees with mangroves? Uh, so actually, uh, this is interesting because you can find in the last slide itself. So this is mangrove, and this you can consider as the trees. The dark red colors are trees. Uh, it is visually you can interpret, but in digitally, because these mangroves are highly inundated, always they are inundated by tidal water. Okay. but whereas the upland trees or vegetation or agriculture terrestrial trees uh, this is again a terrestrial vegetation they are not uh, with water they don't have background of water here itself you can see this red is different from this red because they are always inundated with water and we have different multi spectral bands uh, in the nir region and then short wave infrared region so mostly the short wave infrared region are uh, because the short wave infrared region absorbs water so that band helps us to distinguish the mangroves from the terrestrial vegetation widely a short wave infrared band is used okay. yeah that's good and then uh, like last final question in kerala yes. why we are not having uh, this mangroves ma'am and uh, when you are we uh, have mangroves we have mangroves in kerala of course in vssc near to vssc or veli lake veli creek right there are some few mangroves are there and i heard that from vssc um, people also that restoration activity or plantation activities were carried out uh, maybe i don't know about the successfulness of the uh, thing or otherwise we have mangroves all along the coast in kannur and then the Uh, Cochin Creek or Cochin backwater also has mangroves, but not very large extent. You know very well this is very um, steep slopes we have. We don't have much of the uh, flat region, okay. so mangroves come in the flat region. Okay, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, very interesting and enough informative talk to us. Uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, um, Madam for the uh, very elaborative, very nice lecture. Uh, thank you, Madam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Uh, now coming to the session, uh, I could see. Uh, I could see. Let's uh, check out. So almost all. Almost all. Uh, Hello. Uh, I'm. Uh, Kiran, I think uh, there are two computers in your same room. Please, uh, uh, at, a, at a given time, only one computer should be there. Ah uh, no, sir. Only one PC only. We have one PC. You are getting reason from your. Uh, uh, it's okay. Okay, I will bring my mobile. <laughs> Okay. Yes, so now it is fine. No, still same problem. I suggest the uh, coach here to take over. Yeah. Uh, okay, sir. Hello. Yeah. Uh, am I happy? No, there are also same problem. Uh, I'm seeing. It's. Hello, sir. Please. Can you speak to me? Hello, sir. Can you speak to me? Sir, my hand is cold. Hello, sir. I don't see you, sir. Wait. Uh, hello. 
Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Uh, he supposed to his talk supposed to be in the session B of day one, and now we moved this to uh, this section. It will be uh, around sixteen hundred hours, ten minutes presentation. And uh, now I would like to uh, take uh, when Subramanian co-chair to introduce our lead talk, uh, Dr. K. N. Uma. Over to Subramanian. Thank you, uh, Kiran sir. And uh, yeah, uh, before uh, we uh, go into the lead talk by Dr. K. N. Uma. So I am just uh, give a brief introduction about her. Dr. K. Numa did her PhD from uh, National Atmospheric Laboratory and uh, postdoctoral fellowship at SPL. And now presently she is a, a senior scientist uh, at the Space Physics Laboratory, uh, working in the field of resistive convective systems and its associated dynamics. Uh, she is a recipient of UC uh, Young Scientist, IET Young Scientist, uh, Kerala Young Scientist, and also she has been awarded that. ISRO Merit Award, one of the prestigious awards from ISRO, and many awards received by her. She had about 35 plus publications in uh, referred international journals. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, I would like to uh, uh, Uma to uh, give a presentation. Uh, before that, you are, uh, Uma, uh, there is a request from LOC to, uh, to reduce your speaker volume. Is it okay? I have reduced to 50. Am I audible yeah, I now? I think it's uh, clear, uh, Uma. Yes. Yeah, I have, I have reduced from, it. Uma is very clear. Please proceed. Yeah. Is the slides visible? Yes, Uma. Full screen? No, not it. Try to share your whole and you can open. Yes, now it is fine. Yes. Is it full? Yes, it is full. Screen. Hello? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Hello? Full screen? Yes, Uma, it, it is in full screen. You can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. slides okay. are changing also. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you have, uh, I will give you a uh, bell at around 17 minutes. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Subo. And sure. thank you, Kiran, sir. And thank you, the LLC convener, for giving me this lead talk. And good afternoon to one and all uh, present in this online meeting uh, of a uh, PS1 session. Uh, today, I, this meeting, I'll be talking about this Indian summer monsoon, a combat between the deep convection and the upper tropospheric humidity. I mean a combat. It is because it's not, it's a peculiar word what I have used for because we do not know what it, whether the deep convection is uh, giving the upper tropospheric humidity or upper tropospheric humidity is already there and the deep convection is adding more moisture to the upper troposphere. So these kind of uh, lead lag is always there between the convection and the upper tropospheric humidity. So I have used uh, our uh, Indian satellite Kalpana observation to infer some of the information which I'll be giving in this talk uh, and I would like to uh, about my co-author Siddharth Shintadas and Bukhya Sama is also part of the study. A uh, little background of uh, this upper tropospheric water vapor. We all know upper tropospheric water vapor is a major greenhouse gas and it plays a multiple role in the various complex process of the atmosphere and uh, we all know this upper tropospheric humidity the main source is the deep convective systems that injects the water vapor into the upper troposphere and the lower stratosphere. And uh, we know that uh, this upper tropospheric humidity has a strong correlation with the convection and also the frequency of the deep convection. When you talk about this uh, upper tropospheric humidity, when you take any environment, it uh, two types of uh, problem can happen. If, you're at, if the environment is dry, like it is a subsaturation, not a near saturation, 
so adding in humidity to the atro to the environment can add more moisture thereby hydrating the upper troposphere on the other hand if the uh, background is already moistened a super saturation or saturation kind of a thing then this little uh, this adding this ice or adding this uh, humidity and uh, the result in the form of the more clouds and thereby the dehydration can happen so what is that the humidity in the background environment plays a major role whether it will hydrate or the dehydrate and what kind of mechanism that can happen so and when you talk about this overall yes fine but when it comes to indian summer monsoon it is not only the uh, convection and the upper troposphere humidity and what we talk about the uh, main uh, thing is the background dynamics for example the low level jet the tropical easterly jet and many complicated processes are involved when you talk about this upper troposphere humidity and convection so like when we talk about this water vapor how it is get transported before going to the main results i'll touch upon few uh, uh, important uh, phenomena how this transport happens uh, like for example uh, you can see this is the uh, water vapor mixing ratio from the ra mls and this is the pressure level and over the northern bay of bengal and the east equatorial indian ocean i have shown here and you have seen these uh, water vapor mixing ratio at different pressure levels and this is the famous tape recorder effect which was discovered by moti thal and it clearly shows that how the water vapor it gets from it it happens in two step means a convection transports the water vapor up to the uh, to below the ttl up there and after that it's a slow ascending motion that takes the water vapor to the stratosphere means uh, the scales at which the time scales at which this happens is entirely different very fast is one and the second is very slow and it is not only controlled as i said uh, only by the convection and the water vapor the temperature because when you can see in this uh, during this northern bay of bengal you have convection only during the june july august as we all know monsoon convection but the water vapor is transported only in the month of the august so for east of our indian ocean when you see which is the ascending rim of the hadley cell you always have convection but still the water vapor is transported only in the month of august and we see why it's so it is the temperature that plays a major role uh, because the tropopause temperature guides it with below ttl because if the warmer uh, temperature lies then the uh, holding capacity increases so the water vapor go, can increase so that way uh, the temp warmer temperature results in the more water vapor in the month of the august and you can see here is also august and january january you see a dry air sitting in exactly at 100 hpa itself but when you see in the august it is see you can see up to 60 hpa it is sitting then when it comes to the global monsoon how this water vapor gets transported as i said in the beginning the tropos temperature we talked about and then there are different mechanisms it's not only the temperature you see like uh, this is the december january february you have the southern hemispheric water vapor is maximum and during june july august you have the northern hemispheric monsoon containing rich amount of water vapor so when you see the water vapor at the 100 hectopascal and 82 hectopascal we see about uh, 5 6 ppmv but you see the saturation mixing ratio means when you talk at 100 hectopascal and 82 hectopascal the saturation mixing ratio what is being given here in the, all the monsoon regions is about 18 20 30 ppmv right so this much of water vapor that it can go into this regions it can persist but it does not we see only 5 to 6 ppmv so there are several reasons for happen for this to happen even though the saturation mixing ratio is very high we still see a little amount of water vapor only at the below and up uh, near the tropopause so that uh, that basically like if you see this ice and the water vapor correlation uh, because when you have uh, ice particles or the cirrus clouds that is presenting at that level so very little amount of the water vapor that is going into it will gets converted to dehydrated so what happens a negative correlation clearly shows the water vapor that is going at that level is getting converted to ice which means what it the way hydrating is converting into the dehydration so that is why we call during the asian summer monsoon the dehydration mechanism is the most prominent but however when you see the north african monsoon you don't see much uh, water vapor in any of these only like a very little uh, but still you have the same amount of water vapor that is in the north american monsoon which is north african monsoon which is shown in the green color that is up to 5 6 ppm that basically comes from this tropical easterly jet it advocates the water vapor to such a greater extent that's what i said the indian summer monsoon this tropical easterly jet play a major role in advocating this water vapor so when we talk about this dehydration yes indian summer monsoon contributes to dehydration uh, then the next question comes yeah indian summer monsoon it's not only like all the time it is it's not an active convection right 
we have uh, active convection as well as a break phase of monsoon. We call two phases of the monsoon. One is the wet spell and one is the dry spell. And you see a typical uh, rainfall pattern, which is shown here in the active, and this is the break. And you see that this is called, there's a trough region where you have the maximum precipitation. We call it as an active phase because the monsoon trough lies near to the foothill of the Himalayas. So you get more precipitation there and also the Western Ghats. And during the break phase, you don't get because the trough moves towards the foothills of Himalayas and you don't get much uh, rain during that time. However, in the north southeast part of India, you still get a little amount of rainfall because of this Bay of Bengal convection. So when we talk about active and break, uh, it's not only complete dehydration over the Indian summer monsoon that was shown by us. This is the active and this is the break phase of monsoon. Uh, this is from the Kalpana observations, the upper tropospheric humidity, uh, which clearly shows this is the region, active region. You see a complete dehydration of the water vapor and in the southern part and hydration of the water vapor. However, during the break phase, you just see completely hydration is happening. Means during the break phase, hydration takes place and during the active phase, dehydration takes place. Then the next question rises, yeah, this is Kalpana, you have an infrared and uh, most of the time it is uh, sensitive, uh, sensitive to the clouds, you cannot retrieve the upper tropospheric humidity, yes, of course, but what it will do is that uh, we filled all these, um, like I am not shown here, all the pixels with the, when the UTH was not retrieved into 100%, means if the pixel is not there, we fill it with 100% UTH so that we show that if the convection would have occurred, this much would have been the humidity. Then also the result is the same. This means hydrate, dehydration in the active and hydration during the break. But how this is the, then the water vapor mixing ratio is also better to show. So this is from the MLS. You see, yes, during the active, less water vapor is complete. You see, it's completely dehydrating. However, during the break phase, it is hydrating. Then what is the reason for that? We've showed that it is a cirrus that basically is controlling that because during the active phase of the monsoon, you see a large number of cirrus which is not seen during the break. That is what I shown in the previous slide. If the cirrus or the ice clouds are present, the hydration, the water vapor hydration can convert into dehydration. So with that, when we see, yes, I have shown you how the water vapor gets transported, how the hydration and in the Indian region, how the dehydration and the hydration in both the phases happens. So next investigation for us to see that if that is the case, yes, when, when and where it will happen. Like for example, uh, as I said, the background dynamics is playing a major role. We should know whether the convection is occurring first or the upper tropospheric humidity is occurring first. If that is occurring, how it is uh, managing and what is the time difference between the two. Uh, so this, uh, by using this outgoing long wave radiation for precisely representing the convection, and the upper tropospheric humidity, we use exclusively Kalpana. I wish to mention here one thing, Indian satellites have been exclusively used for, um, for my uh, for our studies. Why? And I want to motivate all these young generations sitting over there. You can exclusively use Kalpana in 3D megatropic software for all your analysis in order to show all the kind of atmospheric phenomena that is happening. And ice water content and cirrus clouds, we have used the cloud set and calypso. And the winds, we have used the IMDA reanalysis, which is also the Indian reanalysis that has been recently uh, published. So this is a general monthly variability of convection in the UTH. Uh, you see the OLR watts per meter square and the upper tropospheric humidity. You see the OLR is less than 220 watts per meter square over all these regions. And this region, you see, this is the cloud pool of uh, inhibited cloudiness, we call. However, you see the upper tropospheric humidity, even though the convection is not seen here, you see the upper tropospheric humidity. Means what? The transport plays a major role in giving this upper tropospheric humidity. And uh, this is coming to the diurnal variability of this convection, the UTH. Uh, this is for the different years from 2010 to 2015 I have shown here. And this is the OLR watts per meter square. And this is the upper tropospheric humidity. Here also it's the same. And time, this is the diurnal variability, which is the advantage of using Kalpana because we can get a uh, very high resolution, temporal and spatial measurements of this humidity as well as OLR. You can see clearly this is the days and this is the time. And you see whenever the OLR is less, you see upper tropospheric humidity. Uh, clearly the pumping when uh, during the 2012 you can see very less uh, uh, number of convective events and accordingly the upper tropospheric humidity was also according to that you see 2013 2014 and 2015 also so this clearly pictorially represented yes there is a correlation as we all know between the convection and the upper tropospheric humidity uh, then uh, we took a specific uh, grid in order to show what uh, that as i said which is leading and which is lagging 
you can see here this is a specific uh, different uh, particular points of latitude and longitude we have taken and you can see olr in the x axis and the uts uh, in the y axis the negative correlation is clearly seen this negative correlation is indicates that when the convection is there upper tropospheric humidity is convection olr is less upper tropospheric humidity is more means the convection is pumping the moisture into the upper troposphere that is the case till now and uh, the width of the correlation you can also see it is varying it depends like as i said earlier this width will determine whether it's a dehydrating or hydrating the upper troposphere that is, that will be determined from the width if it is more width and you can see that the more humber hydration is and if the width is typically in a very narrow and this thing you can tell it's a dehydrating the upper troposphere and this is a particular you can see olr we have uh, taken the average of that and shown the uh, was with the standard deviation and the 95% confidence level also it's shown here and you can see that this is the olr and uh, uts why i want to show the specific in that you can see when the olr is less you see after some time only the uts is getting peak means it's not the sudden pump for this particular case when you see this particular two aspects when the convection is there the uts is immediately pump means the convection is immediately transporting the water vapor to the upper troposphere and this particular thing you see the convection is there but before that itself you see a small peak in the olr and then increase and there is a dip again even though it is there this peak is seen so there are three different things that is happening one the convection is leading the uts sometimes the convection is directly means a normally a zero lag kind of a thing is seen with a uts and number three the convection is lagging the uts to get a detail one second uh, yes uh, last last 3 minutes sir please yeah yeah i am going to finish yeah. yeah now you can see that this is in 2010 11 and 12 i have shown here this is a spatial correlation analysis between the convection and the upper tropospheric humidity uh, which shows the lead lag you see over the indian landmass you are seeing a lag it means what the uts is leading the convection means the upper tropospheric humidity is already present there and convection is happening next and when you see in the, over the oceanic regions it is the convection that is pumping the uh, uts which is the positive correlation this is the time this is calculated basically by considering the olr less than 220 watts per meter square and the uts should be greater than 80% then only we have considered that grid and that grid if we have, we have done the correlation analysis with the time difference shown in the color bar so this clearly shows over the indian landmass we have a lag and over the uh, uts is leading and over the oceans the uts is lagging the convection then we see with the because if that is the case as i said we have shown how the ice water content and how the cirrus distribution is seen you can see that uh, this is the ice water content you can see most of the, in the over the indian landmass you see a maximum ice water content of 30 gram per meter cube however over the oceans we have seen a little less uh, compared to that of the landmass and also we have shown the percentage occurrence of cirrus where you can see over the landmass is completely dominate over the indian region you see a very thick presence of cirrus it would have been great if we have a diurnal distribution of cirrus clouds then we can find out the relation between the upper tropospheric humidity and the cirrus also means if the upper tropospheric humidity is high whether the cirrus is there or if it is not there such kinds of ice clouds are not forming or whether the lead lag is there unfortunately we don't have such kind of a information that is why i have given a gross picture yes the presence of ice water content and the cirrus clouds are there and this is the famous picture i need not go into details you have the low level jet and you have the tropical easterly jet that is present uh, over the, all the years and you see a uh, thick sometimes it is weak and sometimes it is strong like you have a very strong uh, tj in these and you have a weak in 2015 so that kind of interannual variability also exists in this jet streams so i am just putting forward this kind of a hypothesis in this present study this is my last line like yes what if yes i have a lead i have a lag then what is next for example let us take an ideal case where you don't have llj and you don't have any tj and this is the atmosphere where you have like uh, atmosphere is moist already a moist and you are adding more moisture by means of convection so more moisture means then you have a thick cirrus that may be forming so if this thick cirrus is forming then it may cause a kind of a cooling effect so that it can give a feedback to the convection uh, it can be a negative feedback however when the atmosphere is dry at this upper troposphere is dry and you are adding a little moisture or more moisture by means of convection still the moisture will be comparatively less in the pre to compare to the previous one so in that case we assume like because the thin cirrus can form it cannot aid because you don't have much deep convection it may have will formation so it can be a thin cirrus so it can lead to a warming effect and that warming can be a positive feedback to the convection
this is an ideal case yes over the any region but over the indian summer monsoon when we comes we have two major jet streams one the lmg and the other one is a tropical easterly jet you see that uh, suppose i have a similar case study which is already moist and we are adding more moisture so the thick cirrus will be forming and the thing is that if this uh, if it is thick cirrus is there then it can, it should lead to the negative feedback right because as i said earlier but however this llj this low level jet will be keep on pumping this moisture and that will form the convection and so there will be always a fight between two which is going to win this it will uh, win this war whether this if this is more and this is going to happen or what kind of a mechanism will be happening here and the other side also suppose uh, as i consider like lagging and leading if the upper troposphere humidity over the land mass that's what i have written here land mass over the land mass we found that upper troposphere humidity is leading the convection means the upper troposphere humidity is already moisture and your teg is also bringing the moisture from the background ocean and so it adds more and more moisture and the convection is also adding more moisture so this will be forming a thick cirrus again the cooling effect can happen but however this llg again tries to fight with it so uh, this clearly shows this two uh, more major jet stream can major uh, can uh, decides the fighting factor between the uh, uh, feedback of the convection uh, in terms of this upper tropospheric humidity so with that uh, what i will just to conclude like we see the uth leads olr by 2 to 4 hours indicating the upper troposphere is already wet over the land mass compared to the oceans however over the oceans we see olr is um, the means convection is leading the uth and then uh, this moistening uh, the, yes even though the moisture whether it is a dry or moistening is happening the teg and llj will may play a major role in deciding the feedback to this convection uh, so the analysis reveal the role of llj and teg in deciding the negative and the positive feedback to convection through the upper tropospheric humidity so the study also putting forward again like convection need not be a necessary condition for the upper troposphere to be highly humid it can come from the background atmosphere and the convection that can have more moisture and lead to positive or the negative feedback depending upon the background dynamics with that i end my talk and thank you i would like to take more questions if there are any yeah uh, thank you dr uma uh, it is a very comprehensive study between the deep convection and the photosphere humidity i can see that there are more questions uh, i will just read out tj uh, will last maximum up to 25 to 30 degree north but water vapor extends up to 40 degrees how to explain this can you uh, explain no no i am not getting i i didn't hear, hear the second part i understood that up to 30 to 20 degree north tj will be maximum after that what was the next question Uh, but water vapor extends up to 40 degrees how to explain this no tj does not have like water vapor is basically because of the monsoon convection like when you see the trough and then the uh, you have seen the monsoon trough right the monsoon trough is a basically the convective uh, phenomena that will pump more water vapor that like you would have seen the tibetan anti cyclone and all those things this tj is only play a major role in transporting this water vapor and uh, from the nearby oceans so the that will only have a major role in the transportation but the monsoon is basically okay. the convection yes yeah i go, go ahead don't. yeah yeah hi and so the tropical easterly yeah. jet play a major role uh, in transporting this water vapor uh, from the nearby oceanic regions over the indian land mass yeah uh, there is a, uh, another question what about applicability applicability of kalpana data for short spatial temporal scale mountain convection and they didn't i think some music is coming in the background subhu no so what about applicability of kalpana data for short yes. spatial temporal scale mountain convection especially for cloud burst scenario question from the tanmay i'll read from the chat box it's better i think i think some music is coming in the background i am not able to read what about the applicability of kalpana data for short spatio temporal scale mountain convection ah yes of course that is what i was telling this kalpana data can be very well used for studying this convection like uh, because when you have a 15 20 minutes this gives at every half an hour you can definitely use it to understand uh, the formation of this convection and the transport of this water vapor okay. definitely you can use for that okay yeah uh, if not more questions uh, i would like to thank you once again uh, dr uma i think i think nice one more thing is warming and cooling due to cirrus will depend on the number of cloud layers 
will the last slide hypothesis yeah, I... will be valid under the multi layer clouds oh that's a very good question uh, yes uh, it warming and cooling of course it depends upon that and yes multi layer clouds also will play a definitely a major role uh, we need to have more kind of observations uh, to differentiate these kind of cloud layers and we have to see the presence or the absence of such cloud layers what kind of an impact it will have on the surface Okay. Uh, you can you can post your answer in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you once again, Uma. Uh, you may leave this uh, this one. Then uh, uh, is Subrata Rao is available? Yes, he is available. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I invite uh, Subrata uh, Rao. Uh, he's uh, he's going to talk about the simulation of impact of surface infrared heating and growth of the cloud. Uh, you may take over, uh, Subrataj. You just ask whether the slides are okay. Hello? No, no, it yeah, yes. Uh, is the slides are visible? Uh, not yet. Right. Please share it. Now is it visible? Yeah, just hold on. May it may take some time. No, not it. Total uh, screen. Presentation. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Subrajit, so, it is in a uh, full screen mode. Uh, you may go ahead, please. Carry on. Uh, my, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Subrajit Rath, working as a senior research fellow in National Atmosphere Research Laboratory at Tirupati. And I'm going to uh, present on the topic of simulation of impact of surface infrared heating and growth of the clouds. So in general, infrared radiation plays a significant role in growth and decay of any clouds. May it be cirrus or uh, stratus or stratocumulus. And inside the clouds, thermodynamical process like uh, latent heat, sensible heat, and uh, radiative process like infrared heating and cooling plays an important role to develop turbulent motions. And this turbulent motion act as a catalyst to change in the cloud uh, microphysical parameters via coalition coalescence process preferential concentration of droplets and by this uh, changing in the uh, by changing in the microphysical parameter the droplet size distribution and uh, droplet size distribution favors more towards the larger size droplets whereas the warm and, initi warm and initiation time de uh, decreases and surface precipitation increases and in case of turbulence transmitters from the cloud that infrared radiation i am talking about it is increases and the reflectance decreases this is a simple uh, this is a simple picture of the uh, infrared radiative heating and cooling cloud dynamics and the change in the cloud microphysical parameters and my objective is to assess the impact of infrared, infrared radiative heating on the growth of clouds on the next slide i am showing illustration of the turbine generation on the top top radiative heating and cooling process And uh, on top, bottom of the cloud, the cloud base infrared heating and cooling. Both of the process, uh, both of the process present inside the clouds and makes the vapor the turbulence inside the clouds. So these are the data sets I am going to use. Uh, one spectroscopy database of Hytran and reanalysis data of ECMW ERA5 and uh, IC satellite data for the spectral samples. So in methodology, I'm going to calculate the absorption coefficient, uh, absorption coefficient of this web numbers. And in the right side, you can see the algorithm, the flow chart for the calculation of absorption coefficient. And uh, from taking the data from Hytran uh, line by line spectroscopy parameter and uh, cubic square interpolation of temperature and pressure from the era five field, we can find the pressure broadened half widths 
and pressure and temperature depend of the line width with respect to pressure and temperature and line intensity at different uh, temperature with addition to this we can calculate the lorentzian profile in the spectral lines and from uh, lorentzian profile of spectral lines and the temperature and pressure induced line width we can calculate the absorption coefficient in the left side is the simplest form of the absorption coefficient we are taking in uh, taking into account of the avogadro's number and uh, molecular molecular weight of uh, gas and sq is the intensity with respect to the different temperature and pressure uh, we have calculated from the cubic spline interpolation and uh, yk is the pressure burden half width in the upper part and uh, mu uh, lambda is the pressure broadening over wavelength at different pressures so these are the calculated wavelength uh, calculator absorption coefficients for uh, uh, normal room temperature and pressure that is 180 m and 298 kelvin and uh, for the o3 we have found that at uh, 105 in y axis absorption coefficient present and x axis wave numbers are present which are nothing but the one of one by wavelength so in o uh, for the ozone we have found 1054 centimeter inverse which is at 9.48 micrometer in wavelength for o2 6.19 micrometer for the co2 we have found at two peaks which are at 4.23 micrometer and a smaller one in 14.9 micrometer and for the so2 we have found two peaks uh, the nearby that 13 is 7.3 micrometer and 7.23 micrometer and for the water we have found at the 1653 uh, 1653 uh, centimeter inverse in the wavelength or uh, wave number 6.04 micrometer so uh, after calculating absorption coefficient we have to take care of the convective diffusive equation inside the clouds so for that we have taken uh, advective diffusive equation and uh, uh, and implement final uh, finite volume method to calculate the change in heat generation either it may be cooling or heating inside the clouds and uh, absorption coefficient calculated from the spectroscopy parameters and uh, era 5 we have taken and uv w parameter from the era 5 we have taken then change in vertical momentum we can find out with respect to the pressure gradient within the clouds and pressure gradient can be find out with respect to the temperature gradient and temperature gradient happening because of the heat generation may be heating or cooling inside the cloud that we can find from the advective diffusive equation we have taken a grid resolution of 1 meter in 1 meter in x and y direction and 0 0.1 0 0.1 meter in the z direction that is our label and by calculating this uh, by calculating ad and by calculating the change in entropy from this uh, era 5 data and interpolated value we, we can found that change in temperature that is dq is the change in heat generation by change in entropy and from dt we can calculate the change in momentum per unit mass so these are some uh, some pictures from uh, some uh, calculated w momentum perturbation per unit mass for different grid boxes i have taken six grid boxes for the figure here and in x equal to 1 means in x direction all the grid boxes are same and in y direction it will be different and in uh, x x axis of the pictures height from the base of the cloud i have taken only from the 50 0 to 50 meter and in the y direction we have taken the uh, perturbation and velocity uh, vertical velocity and we can see that in the uh, lower most it is almost uh, 0 to 0 0.1 uh, almost all cases but while increasing in the level increasing in the height the perturbation and vertical velocity is increasing so in my conclusion part uh, the new subgrid scale parameterization have been uh, calculated with respect to radiative cooling and heating from the cloud of the base of the cloud and absorption of the molecule in the infrared spectrum have been calculated and finding in influence on the vertical velocity have been examined using uh, advective diffusion equation. It is found that infrared heating from the bottom causes the vertical velocity of perturbation in vertical velocity of the magnitude of minus 0 0.2 uh, meter per second inverse to 1 meter per second inverse. In latter part, we will do the lateral wave generation due to lateral heating to find the 3D perturbation in vertical velocity. So that will be all. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Subhash uh, uh, for uh, you know finishing in time. I think uh, I could see there are no questions in the chat box, but uh, I would like to ask one uh, clarification, uh, Subhash So in yes, your sir. simulation, 
yes. you have taken the grid resolution 1 meter into 1 meter into 0.1 meters yes sir. Uh, it assumes 0.1 10 centimeter uh, that uh, 0.1 meter in the vertical direction yes uh, do you think that you know this uh, whatever uh, this one it is size will be uh, not less than the 0.1 meter so again uh, size no no why uh, uh, what is the uh, you know uh, point in taking the 0.1 meter in a vertical grid resolution sir uh, what makes you choose the 0.1 meter in the vertical grid resolution so the main uh, main concern is of to find the uh, convective process and to satisfy the hydrostatic equation also we have taken this 0.1 meter in the vertical direction so okay okay so this is it thank you yes thank you. yeah thank you i think there are no questions uh, yeah. Yeah. i think uh, yeah is priti ghairo is uh, available yeah i can see yeah uh, next uh, talk will be presented by uh, priti ghairo improving ims are based dim using successive best uh, pixel selection approach for dim fusion is priti ghairo is there yeah yeah slides are visible yeah it is in full screen mode you may start please uh, voice is not audible hello hello yeah now it's audible okay sir um yeah your slides are okay uh, good evening yeah. everyone Yeah, good evening everyone. This is Preeti Kirohi, student from Food Monitoring Department of IRS ISRO Dehradun. And uh, uh, in, uh, uh, I have my uh, guide, Dr. Ashutosh Bharadwa, sir, who is scientist engineer SF from PRSD IRS ISRO. And we are here to present on our research study. And the topic is improving SAR interferometry based digital elevation models using successive best pixel selection approach for DEM fusion. So let's start with some of the basic concepts study the synthetic aperture radar which is an active imaging microwave sensor and a side looking radar which measures the intensity and phase of the backscattered radar signal in one or more polarization channel the term synthesis refers to synthesizing an effectively large aperture from a sequence of smaller antennas eco combining them coherently that moves along the flight line to improve the azimuth so there are two techniques for processing the sar data set first is the polar polarimetry sar which is sensitive to the uh, which is sensitive to the uh, yeah. uh, physical properties of the the scatter like the direction symmetry and the dielectric of the scatter to the direction like the direction and change to the scatter. So, uh, the two images acquired for the same area at two different times and interface them to generate an interferogram which shows the differential range change. So the interferogram has two components. One is the phase image and second is the coherence image. The phase of the interferogram is highly correlated with the terrain topography and the surface deformation can be the Koran shows how similar each pixel is between the secondary and the reference image on a scale of 0 to 1. So inside technique is one of the way of generating high precision and quality DEM. And uh, DEM is basically a 3D representation of Earth's surface showing the elevations. And it can be in a raster grid form or a vector tin form. So the main motivation behind our study is that uh, techniques for generation of DEMs, which, uh, which are basically dependent on the uh, uh, input to data set that they uh, take, like the stereo photogrammetry, radar grammetry, SAR interferometry, or the using the LIDAR data points. So the DEMs are primary and key input for several modeling or quantifying processes that involves photography. The vast areas of application of DEM uh, include disaster risk management, urban planning, environmental planning, infrastructure planning, transportations, and so on. So accurate and high quality DMs are very crucial for these applications. And also any improvement in the generated results will add to the potential value of the DM as an input to these uh, applications. So there is a need to discuss and 
and the impacts of various parameters such as the geography and topography of the area its terrain the slope aspect and the light uh, landform types and so on that can affect the accuracy of the insar based dams moreover the advantages of fusion of multi source or multi temporal or multi baseline data set uh, can be explored and the use of i set to uh, data set as a reference for this accuracy and quality of the results can be explored so this is the base of our study and the main objective of the study is to improve the sar based dams using the uh, uh, new approach of successive best pixel selection uh, for the dam fusion the study is further divided into two sub objectives the in the first sub objective we are generating the insar based dams and uh, for this the uh, selection of various pairs is done on basis of the uh, crucial factors such as the baseline coherence viewing angle and so on that affect the generation of insar based dams and we are assessing its accuracy using the space bar lidar data and in the second sub objective we are developing the algorithm for a new approach of dam fusion that is successive best pixel selection approach uh, and uh, improvement and we are also finding how the iset photon data uh, can validation of various dam generated from the insar technique so talking about the study area and the data set uh, the study site which uh, which is chosen for our study is the uh, gazibad and its surrounding region it it is majorly located in up and some portion of ncr the footprint of the sar Uh, here in this map, the actual overlay of the study area, which is covering the district of majorly Gazibad and some portion of Bagpat, Meerut, and Delhi, are also covered. It is basically a plain terrain area as it is a part of Gangetic Plains, and the major land cover classes that are observed here are the urban class, agricultural fields, the barren lands, and some of the water bodies. So uh, here we are using the Sentinel One AC band SAR data set. and in this we are using the level 1 uh, slc rw products which which is having a swath of 250 kilometers and a spatial resolution of 5 meter by 20 meters and uh, uh, this is giving a dual polarized data set uh, in vv and vh polarization channel further the i set 2 data which is a space bound lidar photon based data for uh, the validation of our outputs so uh, in this way we have uh, Uh, selected several sar image pairs and generated the interferometry based dms like dm125 and these are basically selected the these image pairs are basically selected on the basis of these crucial factors which are critical baseline that includes the perpendicular lateral baseline the viewing angle in which node the uh, data was acquired in the sending or descending node the operating wavelength which is uh, in, in this we have used the c band sentinel 1a data and the coherence uh, uh, which which ranges from 0 to 1 and the larger coherence value for selecting the best elevation for each pixel is considered here so uh, this is the methodology uh, uh, study uh, first of all the several sar image pairs are selected as explained in the previous slide and uh, uh, after selecting the suitable subswath and the polarization a stack is created and uh, 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 this stack is basically al aligning the, both the uh, images uh, in a pair uh, at a sub pixel accuracy for exploiting the phase difference of the position uh, then the orbit file information is applied to the stack and an interferogram is generated the interferogram has the phase image and the coherence image then the uh, phase uh, image is further processed with the subtraction of earth phase flattening and the phase filtering is uh, performed to improve the quality of the interferogram and then a subset of this uh, uh, filtered uh, product is and wrapping is performed using the snapo algorithm uh, then the unwrapped phase is then converted to the <coughs> to the elevation and the coherence image is added to the final product similarly following these steps of sar interferometry we are generating multiple uh, dems for the uh, study area and these multiple dems will be the input to our next processing for dam fusion which is selection approach this is a new yeah, method uh, that we have proposed in the study for the dam fusion Uh, for explaining this process let us consider two input dms dm1 and dm2 and each of the dm has an elevation and a corresponding coherence image uh, similarly for dm1 and uh, this is the elevation 1 and coherence 1 and for the dm2 this is elevation 2 and coherence 2 so uh, in the first step of the algorithm one second priti yeah uh, you have uh, two minutes to conclude Okay, sir. Okay, I'll be completing it shortly. Uh, so, uh, in the first step of algorithm is to compare the uh, coherence values of the two inputs. Uh, like C C one one is greater than C two one. Uh, so, uh, this if C one one is greater than C two one, then the corresponding uh, elevation value will be selected for the output. Similarly, for each successive pixel, this will, this algorithm will run, and in the output, we'll have the fused elevation image and the best coherence image that contains or the greater uh, uh, coherence values. And this elevation image is further uh, uh, checked for a range of elevation uh, value sheet uh, of that area. Uh, for this area, the range of elevation uh, was from 120 meter to 280 meter, and the average elevation is around 214 meters. And only the positive uh, input values and the nearest to the truth value uh, uh, are considered for the fused output elevation. So uh, this algorithm is also tested uh, uh, on the other D. 
for this area and i said two uh, data set is used uh, here for estimating the uh, errors between the observed and the predicted uh, predicted values and uh, assessing its uh, accuracy and quality in terms of it the uh, rmse so the well, DMs that we have generated by selecting the SAR image pairs, like DM1 and DM2, 3, 4, and 5. And these are the maps which are showing the variation of elevation ranging from uh, these values to uh, this. Uh, for the same area, we are having two different elevation ranges, and the variation can also be seen in colors in, the, in these maps. Uh, this is the fused output of DM1 and DM2. These points, uh, uh, points basically, I said two uh, points, which as reference uh, for calculation of the RMSE, and these fused output are obtained uh, firstly by deriving the better elevation value for each pixel based on the coherence value, and then uh, selecting the nearest uh, elevation value to the truth value. So uh, the uh, results have shown improvement in the uh, fused output as the DM1 and DM2, which were the input uh, DMs, were have uh, RMSE of 1.58 meters and 1.20 meters, and the uh, RMSE of output has reduced to 0 0.98 meters here. Uh, similarly, uh, the histograms can, al uh, can also be studied for the analysis of this accuracy assessment. Like uh, the, uh, these are the uh, histograms of the input DMs, and uh, this, uh, this shows the uh, uh, histogram of the fused outputs. Um, uh, these are the multiple DMs that we have uh, generated by using the in interferometry technique by selecting the several image pairs on the basis of uh, multi temporal and multi baseline data sets uh, and uh, the coherence also. And uh, these are the fused outputs. Uh, we, uh, and here we can in the colors. Uh, uh, the improvement has shown uh, overall uh, for the fused outputs. Yeah, so finally, we can that the proposed methodology of the successive best pixel selection approach for fusion of urban area in a relatively plain terrain is found successful. And the obtained result shows improvement in the fused output in terms of RMSE. The multiple SAR interferometric of uh, several factors uh, are used for generating the multiple DMs and further for the fusion process. I said two spacebound altimeter data is found suitable as a reference for validation of results and their accuracy assessment. And the results have shown uh, the reduced RMSE of 0 0.98 from 1.58 meter to uh, 1.20 meters of the. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your very interesting talk, uh, Preeti. So due to yes. lack of time, uh, we are not going to take any questions. Okay, yeah, sir. Next okay. presentation will be given by Dr. Fedi Paul from SPL on the topic of numerical study on the impact of cyclone storm Oki on sea breeze circulations over the Arabian Sea. Over to you, uh, Fedi. Yeah, slides are visible. It is in full screen mode. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes, Freddie. You are very much audible. You please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. I will be presenting a numerical study on the impact of cyclonic storm Oki on sea breeze circulation over the Arabian Sea. The main objective of the study is to understand the influence of large scale tropical cyclone on mesoscale circulation, that is sea breeze circulation. And this includes a detailed investigation on sea breeze circulation over the west coast of India. How long does the influence of tropical cyclone prevail on sea breeze land breeze circulation? What all are the influences of tropical cyclone on coastal stations, on sea, coastal station sea breeze circulation, which are relatively away from the storm? Whether or not the return flow is modulated during the passage of the cyclonic storm. So coming to the uh, general characteristics of uh, uh, sea breeze circulation, sea breeze, we know sea breeze circulation arises due to the temperature contrast between the land and ocean. This temperature contrast establishes a pressure gradient across the land and ocean, and which bring the cool oceanic air mass from the, land, from the ocean region to the land. And this flow is known as sea breeze flow. And to complete this cell, a return flow is present on the top of the sea breeze flow. And this sea breeze flow and return flow constitute the sea breeze circulation. So this sea breeze circulation has a significant impact on the weather condition over the coastal region. So for this study, the COSMO model is simulated from 24th November to 9th December on daily basis based on the ICON initial conditions. And uh, two coastal stations were selected. One is over Trivandrum and other is over the Cochin. And this uh, figure shows the trajectory of the Oki cyclonic storm over the Arabian Sea. 
and uh, during the intensification phase of the tropical cyclone oki that is on 1st december uh, the trivandrum location was about 135 km and cochin was about 200 km so we anticipated some modulation in the sea breeze circulation over these two coastal stations due to the presence of the cyclonic storm oki and this onshore flow over these two coastal stations were divided into two components, sea breeze component and coastal breeze component based on the alignment of the coastline over these two coastal stations. And this uh, Cosmo model simulations database is classified into three categories, pre-cyclone phase, cyclone phase and post-cyclone phase. And initially the uh, temporal evolution of the uh, surface layer parameters were evaluated. And these three panels shows the variation of incoming solar radiation, sensible heat flux and latent heat fluxes during different phases of this data set. And this uh, incoming solar radiation is actually an indicator of the clear sky condition. And uh, during clear sky condition on an, uh, a maximum solar radiation of about 800 watts per meter square is uh, recorded over both the Trivandrum and Cochin. But due to the presence of the storm, when the storm was near to these two coastal stations, a drastic decrease in the incoming solar radiation is noted and sensible and latent heat fluxes also showed relatively lower values when the cyclonic storm was near to these two coastal stations. And uh, relative humidity also showed similar pattern except during the time the cyclonic storm Oki was near to these two coastal stations. On 30th November, the Trivandrum uh, showed a maximum temperature of about 21 degrees Celsius whereas Cochin, it was about 31 degrees Celsius. So the low value of temperature over Trivandrum resulted in higher relative humidity, whereas over Cochin, it was relatively drier and the relative humidity was less than 50%. And the minimum surface pressure observed over Trivandrum was 998 HPA, whereas over Cochin, it was about 1000 HPA. So coming to the impact of cyclonic storm Oki on sea breeze component and coastal breeze component, the magnitude of the sea breeze components were, components were larger than the land breeze component uh, during pre-cyclone and post-cyclone phases. However, the duration of the land breeze flow was uh, larger compared to, the, the, compared to that of the sea breeze circulation. But during the time the cyclonic storm was near to these two coastal stations, both the sea breeze component and land breeze component got disrupted and the daily reversal of the wind pattern were not clearly seen during these days. In the case of coastal breeze component, in general, this coastal breeze component uh, showed relatively lower values during pre-cyclone and post-cyclone phases. But during the cyclone phase, uh, this component, this coastal breeze component got strengthened and uh, um, uh, the strengthening of the coastal breeze component is due to the passage of the eye wall of the cyclonic storm over these two coastal stations. And this uh, impact of cyclonic storm Oki on sea breeze component and coastal breeze component were present. Uh, even uh, even after two days of the passage of the cyclonic storm Oki. So coming to the uh, uh, pressure gradient, daily variation of the pressure gradient force between the ocean and land. This, is, this first figure shows the variation of the, I mean, uh, daily variation of the uh, pressure gradient force between the two coastal stations and adjoining oceanic region. During pre-cyclone and post-cyclone phases, we have not seen any significant variation in pressure gradient force. But uh, when the time cyclonic storm was near to these coastal stations, Trivandrum showed a decrease in pressure gradient from 4 HPA to around uh, 2 HPA, whereas Cochin, it was merely 1.1 HPA. So in order to quantify uh, the favorable condition for the sea breeze circulation, we have introduced a new parameter, that is the ratio between the sea breeze component and the magnitude of the coastal breeze component. As the definition of this new parameter uh, shows that a higher value of this uh, ratio, I mean, not a higher value, the, if this ratio is greater than unity, the uh, surface layer flow is favorable for the sea breeze circulation. But if this uh, value is less than unity, this, the, uh, the surface layer flow expands along the coast and uh, that leads to the weakening of the sea breeze circulation. So from this analysis, um, higher value of uh, SBC CBC ratio during pre cyclone and post cyclone phases shows that uh, the conditions are favorable for the sea breeze circulation, whereas lower value during the time of the cyclonic storm, uh, during the time when the cyclonic storm was near to this coastal station, indicates the weakening of the 
sea breeze circulation and the strengthening of the coastal breeze uh, circulation. So, in order to understand the vertical structure of um, sea breeze component over uh, over these two coastal stations, time altitude diagram of the uh, sea breeze component is plotted along with the reanalysis data from IMDA and ERA five during pre cyclone phase. The sea breeze circulation extending up to one kilometer was clearly seen over both the coastal station, that is over Trivandrum and Cochin. But a strong synoptic flow was present over the above the sea breeze circulation, and so we could not distinguish the return flow of sea breeze circulation from this uh, prevailing uh, strong uh, synoptic uh, synoptic flow. So these uh, these signatures were clearly seen in ERA five and IMDA reanalysis. But during the post cyclone phase, retained flow was, flows were clearly visible, extending from one kilometer to about three kilometer over these two coastal stations. And this also clearly Please, two minutes to conclude. This also clearly captured in this. Um, uh, both the reanalysis data set, but uh, during the cyclone phase. Both the um, prominent sea breeze, cycle, uh, sea breeze circulation were not clearly present. Coming to the uh, to in, the, in order to understand the uh, onshore offshore intrusion of the sea breeze circulation, here we have presented uh, the vertical structure of the sea breeze component uh, over Trivandrum and Cochin. This and uh, this uh, corresponds to a particular day that is on 5th December 2017, uh, a clear sky condition. Do, uh, from this analysis, a vertical thickness of sea breeze flow about a 750 meter was present over the Trivandrum, whereas over Cochin it was about 1.5 kilometer. And the signature of the sea breeze circulation was uh, clearly seen beyond 150 kilometer over Trivandrum, whereas over Cochin it was confined within uh, 150 kilometer. But coming to the uh, onshore intrusion of the uh, sea breeze circulation, uh, over uh, the, this onshore intrusion was deeper over Cochin. Uh, it, it extended up to around uh, around 50 kilometers, whereas over Trivandrum it was confined within uh, 30 kilometers. So from uh, pretty last minute to conclude. Yeah. Okay. So uh, main uh, important inferences from the study are a sea breeze cell mostly disappeared on 30th November and 1st December when the storm was near to these coastal station and it resumed a normal condition after two, three to four days. And sea, sea breeze characteristics in terms of horizontal fetch and vertical extents are studied in relation to pressure gradient force and SBC CBC ratio. And during the cyclone phase, the magnitude of CBC showed substantial rise and which coincide with the deep, uh, dip in SBC magnitude, which results in the weakening of the sea breeze flow. And the return flow allows the sea breeze flow become prominent during the post cyclone phase when fair weather conditions prevailed over both the coastal stations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Freddy. Uh, it, it was a nice presentation. I can see there are no questions. Yes, if there are no questions, once again, thank you, Freddy, uh, for giving a nice uh, presentation on the simulation of uh, cyclone storm working. Yeah, uh, next presentation will be given by uh, Kaustu Chakravarti on uh, Mumbai monsoon, unraveling the morphology of clouds and the microphysics of precipitation. Uh, Freddy, can you unshare your close your sharing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is Kostu Chakravarti yes, present? Yes, present on the screen. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, your slides are visible. It is in full screen mode. Okay. Uh, good yeah, afternoon to all of you. Uh, my topic of today's presentation is the Mumbai monsoon unraveling the morphology of clouds and microphysics of precipitation. This is Kaustav Chakravarti along with my co-author Dr. G. Panditarai from the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Well, so we all know and nothing new about Mumbai city, one of the popular urban coastal cities of the, wor of the world. And it's a uh, 2,500 millimeter is the annual rainfall and the highest annual rainfall which has been recorded till date is 3,475 millimeter that is in the year 2019. And in uh, on 26 July 2005, as we all know, the Santa Cruz station received 944 millimeter. But 
the thing is that uh, this is my motivation actually through which I have got to do this type of studies. We can see every monsoon on at least three or four days the or the financial capital of the India gets flooded with water. So uh, we have tried to see that how the uh, this is basically the news, newspaper reports which we can see that uh, this year itself we can see that 25 percent died on a severe rainfall on 18 July and this is a very common features for every year for this uh, urban city of uh, in the urban city of Mumbai. So uh, in order to study the features of the clouds, the morphology of the clouds and the microphysics of the precipitation, I have taken uh, the help of two instruments. Uh, that is the Doppler weather radar, S-band Doppler weather radar, which is uh, installed at the uh, air by Indian Meteorological Department at Kolaba, Mumbai, along with a uh, George Morgan Disrometer, which is placed at the uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji International Airport campus of Mumbai. So uh, if we see the spatial structure of the rainfall over Mumbai, we can able to see from here, uh, at least uh, during the monsoon and the pre-monsoon months, we can see that the, there is a general trend. Of course, there are some exceptions. There is a general trend that the rainfall increases from the south to the north. So uh, just uh, looking into the wind, for, uh, wind direction and the rainfall pattern, take the case of the month of pre-monsoon. I've considered pre-monsoon from the month of March to May and the monsoon is from uh, June to uh, September. Uh, from here uh, in the Santa Cruz station, we can able to see from here that although the easterly winds uh, is that is in blue color, it is about 10 percent, but the rainfall coming from the easterly winds uh, in the pre-monsoon month is around 50 percent of the rainfall. And similarly for the southwesterly winds, uh, where the wind is around uh, 5 percent, the rainfall is about 20 percent, south-southwesterly. While in the case of the monsoon months, uh, for the southwesterly, westerly winds, they are basically uh, dominating with respect to the wind, uh, with respect to the direction of the wind, and also uh, with respect to the rainfall pattern. Now we go to the spatial structure of the uh, clouds as we uh, see during the pre monsoon and the monsoon period. We can able to see from here that uh, during the monsoon period, we can see uh, more of the high reflectivity clouds are dominating around the southern southern direction, whereas uh, this is the southern direction. And whereas uh, we take the case of the pre-monsoon months, we can see the clouds are basically scattered uh, from the eastern to the southwestern direction. So from here, we can even, uh, to see that the rainfall stretches uh, from the eastern and the southwestern part of the Mumbai during the pre-monsoon months, whereas rain remain confined uh, during the southern parts, uh, over the southern parts of Mumbai during the monsoon months. Now, what we have done, we have taken the diagonal variation of the cloud morphology and rainfall microphysics of Mumbai by co located observation of the rain gauge and rain dropset distribution from Disrometer, vertical reflectivity from S band Doppler radar, lightning from the Maharashtra lightning detection network and uh, during the pre monsoon monsoon period. So, let us uh, see into this graph. What we can see from here, it presents the diagonal variation of the cloud morphology and the precipitation pattern over Mumbai during the pre-monsoon and the monsoon period. So uh, these data were plotted during the monsoon period as we have seen from March to May and from June to uh, uh, June to September. So what we have seen from the first figure, take the case of the first figure, it's a diagonal variation of the rainfall. Uh, take the case of the first figure, what we have seen, that we have seen the early morning peak that is from 4 to 7 hours, the afternoon peak that is from 11 to 13 hours, and the late evening peak from the 20 to 22 hours. So now the vertical profile of the radar reflectivity, let's see from here that they are also corresponds to these peaks. What we can see from the, that, the vertical profile of the radar reflectivity, one of the strongest centered high reflectivity clouds are visible around from uh, these 19 to 20 hours we can see from here. While this high radar reflectivity, high rainfall are also complemented with the larger raindrops uh, around the same time instances. We can also see the uh, some larger drops during uh, 12 hours also, but the largest drops we could see from here, domination of the larger drop we can see from here around uh, 21 hours. So now this, when we are see from the pre-monsoon period, the lightning occurrence, last is the lightning occurrence, we can also see that the higher reflectivity, larger uh, raindrops are com also complemented with the uh, higher number of lightning occurrences. 
So now take the case of the monsoon on the right hand side. What we are seeing for the monsoon? We do not see any diurnal variation in the case of the monsoon. So what, what, what we can uh, say from here, the ap ap important features of the monsoon season is that the apparent vertical profile, what we have seen of the clouds, which shows a near continuous existence of the high reflectivity of the clouds throughout the day. But although some, we can see some deep clouds are observed during these 19 hours, they are not accompanied by heavy rainfall or the real larger rain, rain drop sizes. So these contrasting features of the atmosphere during the monsoon and the pre monsoon period are primarily due to the abundant supply of the moisture from the Arabian Sea and relatively low value of the cape over the city during the monsoon event. So the monsoon clouds are last two by... minutes. Sir. Okay. So I will just go into uh, details of a, a, a just brief description that we can see that the cape is more during the pre monsoon period with respect to the monsoon. And this is one, and convective rainfall is also more. So we can see. So raindrops of larger diameter are also seen during the pre-monsoon period with respect to the monsoon months over the Mumbai. Uh, finally, I will just give a comparative study of the Mumbai and the Chennai rainfall. We can also able to see from here that uh, the two, the other two coastal cities. Take the case of the pre-monsoon uh, events over uh, Mumbai. We can see the larger drops are more in the over the Mumbai during the pre-monsoon period, while for the post-monsoon and the monsoon period, we can not, we do not see such larger variation of the uh, raindrops over Chennai. Now, uh, this is actually for we have taken for the year 2019 for the monsoon and the post-monsoon period. The similar uh, similar things are, occur over Chennai. We can see the strong diurnal variation of rainfall in the Chennai. Uh, during the monsoon period, which is not observed during the post-monsoon months. So this is basically due to the surface uh, temperature, uh, uh, which is the diurnal variation is more, uh, the surface temperature is more during the monsoon period with respect to the post-monsoon months over Chennai, for which we can see the pockets of heavy rainfall uh, in the Chennai monsoon with respect to uh, the post-monsoon months. So I will just uh, go with uh, just a small comparison, the diurnal variation of the Mumbai and the Chennai, in the monsoon, we can see there is no diurnal variation in Mumbai, whereas in the post-monsoon uh, monsoon months over Chennai, we can see the diurnal variation. While in the post-monsoon months, diurnal variation is present in Mumbai, no such strong diurnal variation is present over the Chennai. So these are the uh, some of the important factors. Uh, uh, higher reflectivity is more uh, over the Mumbai uh, during this uh, monsoon period why mm -hmm. such things are not observed over the mm -hmm. Chennai. So I will uh, finally uh, conclude, uh, uh, conclude this thing. This is the Chennai mm -hmm. rainfall we are also able to see. I will go with the conclusion that uh, the 50% of the rainfall occurs during the easterly wind, while in the monsoon not such uh, variations are there, westerly and southwesterly wind. And uh, that, uh, when we are con uh, con taking the Mumbai and the Chennai thing, we can see the diurnal variation are present in the monsoon month over uh, Chennai and the diurnal variation is present in the post monsoon months over Mumbai. So uh, these are some of the features and thank you for this uh, giving me the opportunity to all of you for giving this type of talk and thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you Kostoji for a wonderful talk on you know combination of a weather radar and a ground based measurement on uh, studying the microphysics of precipitations. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, next presentation uh, will be Dr. Lavanya from SPN on the topic of the role of bright band characteristics of stratiform rain on the altitudinal variation of raindrops. Uh, over to you, Lavanya. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Lavanya. Can you put it into uh, full screen mode? Yes, sir. Is it visible now? Yeah, uh, slides are visible and not in full screen mode. Now is it visible? Full screen? No, no, no. no. Madam, kindly uh, please share the entire screen instead of any specific window. Okay, okay.
Is it okay now? Yes, it is really okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Good afternoon. Please. I'm Lavinia from SPL. Today I'll be presenting on the role of bright band characteristics of stratiform rain on the altitudinal variation of rain dioxide distribution. So it's well known that in the tropical region, light to moderate rain persists for several hours and it contributes significantly towards the total accumulated rainfall. Such widespread rain can be detected by bright band, which is a radar signature. So bright band can be identified as a layer of enhanced reflectivity. This radar-based quantitative precipitation estimation and evolution of drop size distribution and also its altitudinal distribution depends on the melting process of the hydrometeors. Study shows that there is a little variability in the altitudinal distribution of drop size distribution within the stratiform precipitation. However, the role of uh, bright band within stratiform rain is not widely examined. So altogether, we understood that there is a lack of quantitative evidence in relating bright band characteristics to the drop size distribution and its evolution. So the results presented here will be having a significant importance in improving the radar rainfall estimation and also for Istros carbon propagation experiments. So taking all this into consideration, the objective of the study is to investigate the role of uh, radar bright band and its characteristics on the altitudinal variation of drop set distribution during stratiform rain events. The data set used for this study is uh, from the micro rain data for the vertical profiles and histometer for the surface observation for the time years 2007 to 2015 and also 2018. A total of 467 events has been used for this study. The experiment study uh, site is an Indian tropical coastal station, Tumba. The methodology used for this study is uh, presented here. And first of all, we will be classifying the full data into convective stratiform and transition. So I'll be concentrating mainly on the bright band portion only, mainly stratiform only. So if we are observing a bright band, it can be either convective or stratiform. So if a bright band is present along with the conversion, we take it as stratiform. Now coming to the details of the bright band check, as explained before, bright band can be understood by seeing the reflectivity peak with near to the melting layer height. Also associated with that, a velocity gradient will also be present at the same height. So this is how a typical vertical profile of reflectivity and fall velocity looks like for a bright band case. So here we can see that uh, the melting layer is observed that is zero degree isotherm at a region to be near about uh, five kilometers and the reflectivity peak or uh, right band peak will be seen near to four kilometers. Above the zero degree isotherm, the particles will be in the uh, uh, ice crystals where the hydrometeors will be in a solid uh, state and uh, the, the growth will be happening by vapor deposition process and below zero degree isotherm growth will be happening by aggregation process. And uh, once the uh, uh, drops uh, hydrometeors starts crossing the melting layer, it will start to melt and the uh, ice particles will be having a thin coating of water. Even though the size of particles will not be changing there, since the dielectric constant of water is more than that of ice, radar will be seeing this as a large particle with a high dielectric constant. So it will be recorded as a high reflectivity area. And the size of raindrops when it is leaving the base of the bright band, that size depends on different factors like the bright band height, the bright band thickness, and height of the melting level, which again is having some seasonal variation. And this will be discussed in the coming slides. So the bright band thickness, was what we call is that area between the bright band top and the bright band base. Uh, now coming to the profiles of a bright band and non-bright band, there's an intercomparison, and we can see that for both the reflectivity and fall velocity, the values are more for bright band when compared to the non-bright band cases. In order to understand this concept better, a case study is presented here, which occurred on 16 June 2018 at our location. The top panel shows the contour of reflectivity, and the second panel shows the contour of a fall velocity observed from MRR, and the bottommost panel shows a time series of rainfall, reflectivity, and DM, that is mass rated diameter, observed at the surface using the uh, distrometer. So here we can see the bright band thickening has occurred here, which corresponds to an enhanced reflectivity near to the surface, which is due to the formation of large size drops. And here, this is a comparison between the drop side DST spectra observed by MRR at 400 meter and distrometer at the surface, and it shows clearly shows that it is matching very really well. Now, the uh, comparison between the median volume and diameter DM and bright band thickness is presented here using this whisker clothes for three seasons pre monsoon, monsoon, and post monsoon. The result shows that there is an increasing trend in DM with increasing bright band thickness. But the more thickness of bright band in pre monsoon uh, can be attributed to the presence of uh, large size drops. And uh, this is mainly due to the conduction process. And uh, during bright band uh, in the thicker clouds, the ice crystals will be getting more time to grow by vapor deposition. And also it will be getting uh, more chance for uh, rhyming and aggregation growth as well. So this uh, essentially leads to the formation of large size drops upon melting. And uh, hence uh, high and cloud, um, cold echotrop clouds will be producing larger hydrometeors. Uh, 
The comparison between the bright band peak and thickness between all the three seasons it shows that the thickness of bright band is found to be increasing with the peak reflectivity. Again, this also shows that the large particles which will be having higher reflectivity field will be taking more time while melting and it will be taking uh, uh, traveling more distance, which results in an increase in the thickness of the bright band. Now, how the altitudinal variation of this is happening to understand that better the vertical profile. So during three seasons, pre-monsoon, monsoon, and post-monsoon is depicted here for the all the gamma parameters and not lambda mu, that is intercept parameter, slow parameter, and shape parameter, and also for mass weighted median diameter DM. So here figure shows that in monsoon, that is the blue colored line, that is dominated by small size drops, which is shown as a high N0 value and lambda and also a lowest value of DM. And pre-monsoon is having the large size drops with the high DM and the lowermost N0. And uh, the increase in the lambda mu and dm is observed here, uh, below, especially below one kilometer with decrease in height, and which suggests that evaporation would be the dominant metrophysical process here. And all these results reveal the presence of large size drops in pre-monsoon seasons compared to post-monsoon and monsoon season. All these results are collaborating well with the surface hysterometer measurements at our location as well. Now, this is an intercomparison between the bright band or non bright band events for the all the same uh, gamma parameters itself. So, it's seen that irrespective of the season, the concentration of smaller drop sizes are found to be more in the non bright band cases compared to bright band. That is, here we can see a high value of a DM uh, for bright band events and a lower value of DM for NBB cases. Similarly, high value of uh, uh, N0 is also observed for the non bright band, which suggests the presence of large uh, num uh, number of small size drops. And uh, within bright band itself, we have observed some variation. That is, if the bright band thickness is less than one kilometer and if it is greater than one kilometer, then itself some variations are seen. As the figure shows here, the DM value is found to be increasing when the bright band thickness is more than one kilometer. And the concentration of small size drops are found to be more when the bright band thickness is less. So I am concluding the main uh, summary of this work is that the, there exists a distinct seasonal variation in the altitudinal profiles of drops and distribution parameter for the bright band and, and the non bright band events within the stratiform range. And compared to the bright band events, the concentration of small size drops are found to be more during NBB events for all the seasons. And the median volume diameter DM is found to be increasing with the thickness of bright band. And the concentration of small size the diameters are found to be more in the case of low bright band thickness events, that is less than one meter, one kilometer bright band events. The mean profiles of DM are higher in pre monsoon, followed by post monsoon and monsoon, which is also holding uh, uh, well with the distrometer results. And in case of uh, the increase in the lambda, mu, and DM, with decrease in height, especially below one kilometer, is showing that the dominant microphysical process in that region could be evaporation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Lavanya. It's a nice presentation. And uh, I just have one uh, clarification. Is yes, there sir. any variations in uh, bright band height uh, uh -huh. among the different seasons? Different seasons? Yes. Ah, yes, sir. We are observing a bright band height because since the melting layer is uh, varying with the different seasons, that is uh, slightly attributing to the variation in bright band height also. OK. Thank you, uh, Lavanya. Yeah, our next presentation will be uh, by uh, Dr. Dibojit Sarkar from NARL on the multi-component, uh, multi-phase model for strat stratification compressibility of its atmosphere. Maximum, you asked whether it is audible, whether slides. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah, your voice is audible. Hello, sir. Slides are not presentation yeah. able to see, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Hi, of course, sir. Of course. When you go back? Whether it was properly, whether it was properly. Uh, yeah, Lavanya, can, can you unmute? Is yeah. any other slides are visible? Any other slides uh, no, are visible? Sir. No, sir, not at one second. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. It is in full screen. Uh, he may proceed. Okay, sir. So, yeah, good afternoon. Go so, I am Debojit. 
so i will be presenting that uh, multi component multi phase uh, model for the stratification and compressibility of the earth atmosphere so um, so multi component and multi phase flow system are con uh, consist of different uh, gases species present in the atmosphere and ions and hydrometer species and so on so they are the representation of this all these species is shown here uh, right side from it is uh, extended from aerosol to defined hydrometers like uh, ice water vapor and snow etc so the phase of the any physical system is depends on the different hydro dynamic properties and their external uh, environment and the system will change in such a way that it will uh, reach uh, it will attain minimum gives free energy to attain the equilibrium equilibrium position so this uh, figure is taken from the davis uh, 1992 act so uh, where they have shown the compressibility factor of the atmosphere with the uh, pressure for two different condition that is for dry air and uh, saturated conditions so we can see that the compressibility factor is changing uh, with altitude so for normal uh, solving of the calculation like uh, ideal gas equation we are only considering the compressibility factor equal to 1 so which is not the, exactly the correct to represent the, the compressibility of the atmosphere as well as the density variation or density stratification in the vertical direction to represent the stratification of the different chemical species uh, we have uh, developed the multi component multi system so i will be shown later sorry so uh, then i will come to the chemical potential so this is a property is very important properties which represent that any chemical species whether it will go any chemical reaction or any physical transformation uh, to uh, reach another state or any other new products so most of the conventional uh, method to derive the chemical potential we have only considered the internal potential internal chemical potential so which is represented by the mu int which is calculated based on the uh, activity parameter of the species which is uh, represent the effective concentration of the parameter so uh, we have to consider the other external potential also because if some species is present in the atmosphere so it will come on to the, the different uh, influence of the different field like gravity uh, gravitational uh, chemical potential it will acts on that uh, chemical chemical species and then due to the different mechanochemical processes happening in the atmosphere it will also act on the uh, chemical species and due to the presence of earth magnetic field it will also act on the chemical species so their chemical potential it will change and then other processes like tribochemical which is acts due to the pressure and stress present in the atmosphere and another thing also that uh, if some radiation is present so the chemical species may undergo different free radical mechanism or different transformation so due to that some energy will be lost or some energy will be released so due to that chemical potential will also change and due to the different electrolytic processes happening in the atmosphere also due to that and that chemical potential it will also change so the total chemical potential will be the sum sum of Uh, internal chemical potential and other external potential so uh, then i'll come to that uh, new uh, the parity distribution law so normal parity distribution law which is exponential in nature which describes the pressure distribution of the atmosphere with height but for the uh, for the derivation of normal parity distribution law we have only consider internal chemical potential of the chemical species and uh, only uh, gravitational potential but other chemical potential we have not considered so we have considered other chemical external chemical potential also to derive new variety distribution law based on the study done by the jerometa ganguly 2008 so they has considered that after the any phase transition or mixing of different chemical species the sum of the internal chemical potential and external chemical potential it will be constant so based on that we have derive the an equation how it will change with the height small height so here z is the altitude and delta z is the change in the altitude so this equation if we solve uh, we will get the uh, new distribution law and here we also added a new new term to uh, to solve that internal chemical potential in terms of fugacity coefficient and the mole fraction and here p is the pressure and p0 is that standard pressure at the uh, standard atmospheric Atmospheric conditions. So, after the 
after this taking all the assumption and we also take another assumption that we have taken the vertical uh, resolution of the any atmospheric layer is very fine so that the temperature of the within layer it will be remain constant so we have based on the local thermodynamic equilibrium so after the solving that equation one we will finally get that uh, change of the pressure with small height del z it will be represented by height as the z at level z and extra time it will come due to the phagocytic coefficient and mole fraction change due to the small height change and in, instead of this p there will be some other term so that the normal relative uh, distribution is totally changed so this equation as uh, we have solved this result is uh, presented later so to to solve this equation we have taken case studies of amphan uh, during that uh, 19 may 2020 and this data is taken from uh, the sar met facility and, uh, and the basic parameters taken is temperature pressure and relativity etc and uh, out of the all chemical potential we have presented here only uh, gravito uh, gravito chemical potential and magneto chemical potential so to calculate the gravito uh, chemical potential we have calculated the gravity field above the reference ellipsoid uh, instead of uh, spherical in nature we have not considered uh, here at uh, shape so here the semi major and minor axis we have considered and elliptic elliptical eccentricity also we have, and we have calculated the change of the uh, gravity field above the reference uh, above the ellipsoid of the earth surface so we in different altitude and for particular fixed location that is our sar location and we have also computed the magneto chemical potential based on the model igr uh, done by this tabular et al 2015 so where we have calculated the uh, magnetic flux density from this from this equation magnetic flux density and from the magnetic flux density we have calculated uh, the magnetic flux intensity and from the magnetic flux intensity we have calculated the magneto potential and here the uh, graph it is showing the how it is changing the magnetic flux density how it is changing with height in fixed location that is in balasar so we can see that it is it is decreasing in nature so then we have calculated that uh, gravito uh, gravitational acceleration with height so you can see this is the uh, exponent that is decreasing with height as well and we have calculated that gravito chemical potential for major component of the atmospheric species like uh, nitrogen oxygen argon carbon dioxide etc and we can see that major component of the uh, magnet uh, the gravito chemical potential is contributed due to the presence of nitrogen and then oxygen then argon and so on and the The, the total value of the gravito chemical potential is represented in joule per mole this this by this graph uh, sorry Simi similarly we have uh, we have derived that uh, pressure distribution the partial pressure distribution law based on the new barometric distribution law to see the stratification of different chemical primary chemical species so out of this nitrogen n2 yeah, yeah. and o2 Yes, yeah, sir. Last yeah. one minute, Devchand. Okay, sir. Uh, so partial pressure of that uh, nitrogen or oxygen is represented by this, and this by argon is by this plot. How it is changing with height and their partial pressure. And similarly for carbon dioxide and uh, neon also we have calculated like this way. So partial pressure it is also decreasing in nature. So this is the con. So I will conclude this first slide. Uh, the we have calculated the error of this uh, pressure di new distribution law with respect to the ideal gas law we can see the how it is error is how it is changing with height so then i will come to the conclusion so the new de relativity distribution law as uh, taken consider in the external as well as the internal chemical potential of the chemical species and we have in incorporated the phagocytic coefficient and the activity to uh, for to, to see the contribution in the uh, stratification of the uh, based on the relative distribution law and the formulation also influenced by the shear and friction present in the atmosphere region so thank you sir yeah uh, thank you uh, devjit uh, for your nice presentations and uh, i had one clarification you yes, have uh, listed around seven chemical potential reactions yeah. for your uh, studies out of those 
uh, which one is the most important one for uh, you know uh, contributing the total chemical potential? Uh, sir, uh, yes. Sir. Uh, this is basically uh, major one is the nitrogen actually. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you once again, Madam Devachar. And yes. uh, next, uh, last presentation in this session is uh, by uh, T V Lakshmi Kumar on the integrated monsoon rainfall observation program, defining monsoon rainfall measuring satellites. Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. I'm here, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they have to close the presentation. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I request to Devujyoti, can you close your uh, screen? Yeah. Yeah, now my screen is visible. Yeah, your slides are visible. Your voice is very much audible. You may uh, proceed, uh, Lakshmi Kumar. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Good evening to all. Uh, so myself, I'm uh, TV Lakshmi Kumar from SRM University. Along with me, Dr. M. S. Narayanan, the senior scientist from Space Application Center, Dr. Sanjeev Divedi from IMD Bhuneshwar, Dr. Subramanyam Kandula from SPL, and uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar Thakur is from Tribhuvan University in Nepal, are part of this presentation. The main objective of this presentation is to appeal that there should be a new microwave satellite passive microwave satellite for uh, uh, monsoon rainfall measurements, which will uh, fulfill the present scientific and technical uh, challenges. And prior to this, uh, I mean, <coughs> appeal for the satellite, so we strongly propose there should be an integrated campaign that collects the measurements of uh, rainfall from the rain gauges, uh, uh, Doppler weather radars and satellites. So moving into my slides, so rainfall is an important uh, meteorological parameter and it has high spatial and uh, spatial and temporal variability. This high uh, variability in, on space and time scale is uh, because of mainly the type of the climate of the region and intra-seasonal stations and intra-annual variability. So there are different methods that are, that are being used for the measurement of the rainfall. So as the, from the ground-based rainfall, we can measure the rainfall from the rain gauge, but of course it has the point source and it has its own limitations. And uh, from radars also we can uh, use, radars also can be used to estimate the rain rate and uh, satellites also can be used to estimate the uh, rainfall. But see these three methods use three different techniques. So the data which is coming out from these uh, three uh, methods or three techniques will have larger, large discrepancies. So there was a study from our SRM group. Uh, so we have reported uh, by when, when we compared with the uh, TMPA rainfall, that means the rainfall uh, retrieved from the TRMM satellite and we compare with the IMD uh, gridded rainfall data, we found that the compatibility or the spatial correspondence between IMD data sets and DMPA data sets on daily scale is beyond 5 degree by 5 degree. So this will tell you the discrepancies, the level of the discrepancies between uh, IMD and uh, ground rainfall as well as with the satellite rainfall. So to address the rainfall issue, there are so many programs have been conducted in India there are most, I mean, I think more than 12 programs or major programs have been conducted since 1964. To name a few, so we have International Indian Ocean Experiment, which started in 1964 and ended in 67. Along with that, we have next, you know, followed by Indian Summer Monsoon Experiment, 1973, Indian Soviet Monsoon Experiments, 1977. Of course, the broad uh, program is Monsoon Experiment, which has started in 1979 and followed by monsoon trough boundary experiments. So likewise, there are more than 12 uh, almost experiments have been conducted to address the various issues of the rainfall, but still there are some, still some challenges exist in bringing out the uniform rainfall data sets for India that are compatible or uh, that shows, you know, uniform uh, variation or uniform, uh, I mean, uh, uniform variation uh, in terms of your rain gauge measurements and uh, other uh, kinds of measurements. So India Meteorological Department with other institutes have put up a tremendous effort in bringing out or in maintaining the rainfall records. Of course, we know that India has uh, a wide network of the rain gauges. It has around uh, 6,945 rain gauges uh, have, uh, I mean, in India at different locations and which are being used. Uh, these rain gauges data have been used to develop uh, a gridded rainfall data sets. The methodology of uh, the gridded data sets have been developed by the Rajivan et al. And presently, we are using the version IMD4, uh, which is developed with the PI et al. in 2014. So these data sets are available from 1901 to 2021, 
with a spatial resolution of 0.25 by 0.25 degree. So in addition to these rain gauges, we also have, I mean, IMD, I mean, India has also has a network of 30 Doppler weather radars, which are regularly functioning uh, and in calculating the rain rates for uh, different uh, occasions. So in addition to these uh, rain gauges and uh, Doppler weather radars, satellites also uh, play a crucial role in rainfall estimation. Of course, the advantage of uh, satellite rainfall is their spatial and temporal coverage because if there is any adequate, inadequate uh, a network of the rain gauges so those areas we can use the satellite data uh, for this purpose and the IMRG data which is for example I would like to mention here which is with high temporal and spatial resolution it is available with 0.1 degree by 0.1 degree spatial resolutions and with 30 minutes of temporal resolutions even from India side there is a tremendous efforts have been uh, put, up, put, put up to understand the rainfall issue by using the satellites to start from INSAT series it is started from 1984 and we have uh, INSAT 3D and INSAT 3D4 and version sat one has been added to MSMR in 1999 and recently in, two, in 1919 mega traffics was launched, uh, launched uh, to, as an Indo-French effect to address the rainfall, the Madras but unfortunately you know uh, this Madras also is not very successful because uh, it has worked only for a limited period of time still somehow there is a gap exist uh, even in the satellite data so from Indian side. And in addition to these uh, rainfall, I mean grid, gridded data sets and weather, uh, weather radar data sets and uh, satellite data sets, so merged precipitation products also have been emerged that collects the uh, satellite rainfall data sets and uh, uh, rain gauge data sets. These have, in India, these, uh, I mean, these data have been downloaded by Mitra et al. and group. And uh, here I would like to mention this global precipitation machine uh, uh, measurement machine uh, uh, results IMRG data where the SRM has been actively working uh, in the validation and the comparison of this uh, IMRG results. So this picture shows that you know uh, India we have taken uh, some different uh, regions in, uh, in different uh, uh, areas and we try to compare the rainfall data sets IMRG uh, data sets with the uh, IMD data sets. Even you can see that the it shows that in all the regions you know there is a large discrepancy you can expect you can see uh, as the curves like you know the probability density curve are not uniform are not uh, having you know a similar uh, uh, way which shows that uh, still the discrepancies exist even with the though the IMR has been <coughs> emerged as a promising uh, uh, promising uh, rainfall data but even then when it comes to uh, I mean validation with the Indian uh, rainfall conditions uh, it is still uh, has to be improved and especially when uh, it is a more lacuna has been we have seen when it comes to the terrain region. So in the terrain region, it is very difficult to compare, uh, very difficult to get a good comparison between the rainfall I and mean, rainfall data sets of the satellites uh, as and the uh, ground gauge network. And this uh, figure shows we have added Indian satellite version also, INSAT uh, rainfall also uh, for, for an year 2016, which we made the time series from 1st June to the uh, 30th September which shows that there is a large variability which is not captured by the uh, these satellites and there is though there is a, a relative comparison in the pattern of the rainfall but there is a still a quantitative difference exist in the uh, magnitude of the rainfall data sets which is a really an alarming uh, thing which we need to consider especially when when we are trying to to address these issues uh, when you are trying to uh, monitor some real time uh, some hazardous movements with the real time data so this data uh, is very much uh, you know needful so that you know a, a good data sets is to be prepared or is, a good data set is to be emerged from these uh, satellites and uh, in addition to these satellites and uh, rain gauge rain gauges we also have uh, indian doppler weather radars actually we have 10 minutes time of the doppler weather radars and uh, but unfortunately or fortunately these doppler weathers uh, yeah dr uh, lakshmi kumar uh, yeah. one minute last one minute you oh so we have uh, only uh, what is that uh, occasional occasionally they are working occasionally we are using those data set for different studies the same thing we have used for the chennai dwr using chennai dwr data sets we have compared the chennai deluge uh, 1450 november and 1 to 2 december 2015 which we found that a range of correlation from weaker to the strong correlations we have seen which needs that a lot of improvement in it with this we try to propose a small algorithm that uh, collates the uh, I mean DWR rainfall as well as with the IMRG rainfall to get the ZR relations relationship uh, you know for the all the 30 existing radars and for a uh, with the IMRG data this is the block diagram we try to propose uh, to get the ZR relationship and so that you can get the rain rate more reliably 
and still as uh, keeping in the view that there are some, still some technical and scientific issues to be addressed because we should to have a, a, a what is that a reliable 22 years or let us say trmm started in 1998 almost 20 to 24 years uh, long term data set we need to develop and iao isv like interannual variability interseasonal as, uh, aspects still have to be studied and uh, we have to see that you know where this uh, satellite data sets and dwr data sets and rain gauge data sets are compatible at what scale or at what time scale and what uh, spatial scale we need yet to see that and uh, the accuracy of insat estimates also to be checked again so the main challenges still exist is you know although the rain satellite uh, have proved useful but it have its own many limitations no indian satellite is in gvm gpm constellation after ocean sat 1 and Madras is not being very successful, worked for very limited time. India needs to launch a state of art microwave imaging satellite at a suitable orbit. For defining the specification of such lights, such satellite is suitable yeah, like uh, terrain is RS. Yes, I am done. I am done. Yes, one. Yeah, the satellite yes. infrared terrain area still needs to be a lot of improvement and complete picture of microwave and infrared contributions are yet to be done and increase in the dynamic range is very much required for higher rain rates. For this, we finally uh, propose or appeal that there should be a launch of a monsoon rainfall measuring satellite as part of GPM that will fulfill the lacuna on the Indian region. And for that, defining the specifications again, we need an integrated monsoon rainfall observation program for one, for one full monsoon season. With this, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lashun Kumar, uh, for your you know, uh, new proposal on, you know, in order to bring the validation of the rainfall measurement from space one as well as the ground-based measurement. Yeah, with this, we have come to the end of this session. On behalf you, of the LOC, NSS, I would like to thank uh, everyone for completing the presentation in time. Now I leave it to session chair, Dr. NVP Kiran Kumar. Yeah, uh, is, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Subhu, I am audible. Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Subramaniam for uh, co-chair for this session, and all the speakers who stick to the time, and then uh, and then uh, presentations are uh, very good, and all are informative. And now uh, I I I request uh, next session speakers to load their uh, uh, slides, presentations, and we will assemble uh, at. 1640 uh, just 10 minutes okay yeah. I, I request loc to uh, please uh, help them in doing this uh, dr kiran kumar uh, will be gathering at 1640 or 1630 uh, actually uh, 